The Domestic Policy Subcommittee of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee will now come to order. Today is the second of this subcommittee's two-day hearings examining how the bureaucracy of the private health insurance industry influences the relationship between physicians and their patients. Yesterday, the subcommittee heard the testimony from individuals, doctors, whistleblowers, and policy analysts, all of whom related their experiences with and opinions about the private health insurance bureaucracy and its impact on health care in America. Today, the subcommittee will hear testimony from top executives of the six largest health insurance companies in the United States. And I want to welcome the witnesses and thank them for their presence here. And we look forward to hearing from you. Now, without objection, the chair and the ranking minority member will have five minutes to make opening statements, followed by opening statements not to exceed three minutes by any other member who seeks recognition. Without objection, members and witnesses may have five legislative days to submit a written statement or extraneous materials for the record. I want to add that the House has adjourned for the weekend, and while uh, generally that means that uh, there would be very few members here, I, there are a number of members who have expressed an interest, and you may see them come in throughout the course of the hearing. But uh, good afternoon, and uh, thank you very much for your presence before this subcommittee. Uh, yesterday, we received testimony from the daughter of a man whose bone marrow transplant was delayed an agonizing 126 days. Well, while authorization from his insurer was denied and sustained on appeal. She asks, would there have been a different end to my dad's story if he had been given approval of the first transplant request in April 2006? Would he be alive today? We don't know. What we do know is that his chance for survival most assuredly did not increase because, and she was talking about the insurer, built the bureaucratic roadblocks that changed the course of my father's treatment and made him wait for his potentially life-saving bone marrow transplant. We also heard from the father of a two-year-old who was born with a severe cognitive disorder He's had to struggle to get the coverage to pay, uh, to get the coverage his premiums pay for. Recounting the toll on his family that the repeated delays and denials of care for his daughter caused uh, by his health insurer, here's what he told us. He said the stress of constantly having to hold the HMO and their agents to their agreed upon obligations has relegated me to the role of my daughter's care manager and all too often robbed me of my role as Sydney's loving daddy. The experiences of these individuals are the tip of an iceberg. Court and state regulatory records are replete with recent findings of wrongful denial and delay of health care by private health insurance bureaucrats. Hundreds of thousands of people have been wrongly denied health care coverage, hassled with unnecessary documentation requests, underpaid claims, ripped off by fixed databases that underpaid claims. <coughs> the actions of insurance company bureaucrats in causing needless delays and denials of coverage for prescribed treatment can be as detrimental as the disease itself. Now, this was the conclusion of the Ohio Supreme Court when it upheld the largest jury award in Ohio's history against Anthem for denying life-saving treatment to Esther Dardinger. Here's what the court said in that decision. Then came the bureaucracy. Anthem had warned, talking about the Dardingers, Anthem had worn the Dardingers down as surely as the cancer had. Like the cancer, Anthem relentlessly followed its own course. 
uncaring, oblivious to what it destroyed, seeking only to have its own way. It's from a court decision. Now, regulatory actions and jury awards do not, however, tell the whole story, since these measures consist only of instances in which insurers were caught and punished for violation. There's no record of the silent suffering that our constituents endure without filing a complaint or a lawsuit. Recently, however, the research arm of the California Nurse Association published results of its analysis of claims payment data maintained by the California Department of Managed Health Care. They found that claim denials by health insurers operating in California averaged 21 percent in the period 2002 to June 2009. Unfortunately, we learned yesterday from another witness that there's no comprehensive national uh, data source on all health care coverage that has been denied, substituted, or delayed. In this absence of transparency, health insurance companies promote the public image that they encourage healthy living. All of the insurance companies here today want it to be represented by their top doctors, known as chief medical officers. Had we allowed that, their preferred representatives would have been consistent with the public image that the companies like to project, but it may have denied the subcommittee the ability to probe how health insurers really work. You know, what, what is your business model? Whether a health insurer follows a doctor's order or interferes with it by denying a preauthorization is in large part a business decision. It's not a medical one. Financial analysis of the health insurance industry carefully chart the medical loss ratio, which we're all familiar with, the MLR, the amount of each dollar received in premiums that health insurers spend on medical expenses. Investors consider MLR to be a key indicator of an insurer's ability to control its spending on health care and thereby is a predictor of profitability. Insurance company executives pay attention first to the concerns of Wall Street. We understand that. According to a former executive of one of the nation's largest for-profit insurers, quote, investors want that MLR to keep shrinking. And if they see that an insurance company has not done what they think meets their expectations with the medical loss ratio, they'll punish them. I've seen a company's stock price fall 20 percent in a single day when it did not meet Wall Street's expectation with this medical loss ratio. That's a quote. Private health insurers have developed a sophisticated bureaucracy to find reasons to avoid paying for expensive treatment. They're developing new products with high deductibles and co-payments, so they have to pay health bills. Private health insurers refuse to abandon the practice of rescissions in which they revoke a policy after receiving premium payments once large claims are filed. Over 60 percent of people who entered bankruptcy due to medical costs that caused them to become insolvent had private insurance at the start of the illness. Finally, private health insurers are insuring fewer people and earning higher profits. By avoiding providing coverage to people who get very sick and who have very high medical bills. That's what Wall Street wants to see. And today, thankfully, we have before us senior executives from the six largest private insurers in the nation who are here to explain to this committee and to Congress how you can reconcile the demands of Wall Street, which are quite significant and severe sometimes, demands of Wall Street with the health care needs of your policyholders. That's what we're going to be exploring today. So uh, with that, uh, I am going to recognize the distinguished ranking member of this subcommittee, Mr. Jordan of Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding this hearing. I want to thank our witnesses for being here today. Yesterday, we heard some heartbreaking stories of families dealing with severe illnesses and the amounts of paperwork they were forced to wade through when trying to get treatment. Bureaucracy, whether the government or, frankly, private industry, should not be the final arbiter of health care decisions. In my opinion, those decisions should be between doctors, patients, and their families. I've had constituents come into our office and say that their child got sick and their insurance got canceled. Practice like this are inexcusable. People purchase health insurance to guard against the day their child or spouse become gravely ill. It is precisely these instances when people most need coverage. Individuals who have acted in good faith, paid their premiums, and upheld their contractual responsibilities should, in fact, be covered and get coverage. Last year in the full committee, we held a hearing on improper health insurance rescissions. This was a problem in both California and Connecticut. Rescission should only occur when there is a material misrepresentation of fact or other breach of contract. It must be noted that any rescission even when proper, leaves individuals uninsured. All stakeholders, regulators, insurers, and consumers should obviously try to prevent these occurrences. So what can we do to make sure that all Americans have access to coverage? 
Uh, my friends on the other side believe that more and bigger government is the answer. I think most Americans instinctively realize that trading some challenges with private insurance for the bureaucracy of the federal government is certainly not the solution. Instead, we should keep what works best in the current system and try to reform what's not working. The plan I support has four principles that I think need to be a part of any health care reform proposal. First, all Americans must have access. Second, that coverage should be truly owned by the patient. Third, we must improve the health care delivery structure. And finally, any reform must attempt to rein in out of control costs. As we address these challenges in our health care system, it is important that everyone has a seat at the table. And I am glad that our witnesses can be here today. And I look forward to hearing their testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I, I want to thank my uh, colleague from Ohio. Uh, we have a bipartisan effort here on these committee hearings, and I have always appreciated his uh, perspective and also the fact that uh, you, you sometimes offer a contrary point of view, which is needed to get to the truth. So thank you. Uh, we have the privilege of having the chairman of the full committee here. And uh, I'm sure all members would agree that it is uh, uh, our responsibility when the chairman of the full committee shows up to provide the chairman of the full committee with an opportunity to be recognized. And so at this time, I want to thank uh, Mr. Towns for the support that he has given this subcommittee in our uh, effort to get to the bottom of some of these serious health care issues. And thank you for your support on, on the whole range of concerns that the American people have. Uh, the uh, chair recognizes the chairman of the uh, full committee, uh, Mr. Towns of New York. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank you, uh, Chairman Kucinich and uh, Ranking Member Jordan, uh, for holding this important hearing on unfair practices engaged in by private health insurance carriers. And let me begin by saying I agree with President Obama's statement last week to the joint session that private for profit health insurance companies perform valuable services to their subscribers and our nation. However, President Obama rightly called for health care reform legislation that, number one, that ends discrimination against people with pre existing conditions, limits premium discrimination because of age and gender, so that seniors and women will pay the same coverage as others prevents insurance companies from dropping coverage when people are sick and need it most, caps out of pocket expenses so people do not become broke when they become sick, and eliminates additional charges for preventative care such as mammograms. In many states, insurance companies can simply cancel person's insurance if any existing medical condition is not listed on the application. And this can happen whether the person is even aware of the condition or not. We hear repeated reports that insurance companies limit benefits, simply drop or deny coverage for high risk patients whose claims eat into the carrier's profits and purge small businesses with high claims. Carriers are doing this at the same time that their executives are receiving millions and millions of dollars compensation packages. Businesses cannot provide their employees with coverage due to their own eagerness to make a profit. On the other hand, patients are afraid to disclose health conditions and might even be forced to lie in order to receive medical treatment. Some patients suffer greatly as their health declines without necessary medical treatment. These insurance carriers' practices are unacceptable and must be reformed. I believe insurance carriers must be held accountable. If a company sells insurance, it must provide insurance coverage. When claims are made in that regard, it is essential that Congress enact health care legislation that includes provisions designed to ensure accountability and strong enforcement. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I applaud you and Mr. Jordan for the work that you're doing and the members of this committee. But I want you to know that we have a lot of work to do. 
because as we look and we see in terms of what people are going through, that we must reform it and we must reform it in a positive way. On that note, I yield back the balance of my time. I thank Chairman Towns. Uh, chair recognizes uh, Mr. Foster, who was here uh, even before, uh, no, even before everybody else back. moved. Okay, we'll, we'll go to Mr. Cummings then. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you again for bringing, uh, for holding this hearing. And um, I want to thank our panelists for being here this afternoon. And yesterday we, had, we heard chilling testimony, shocking to the conscience. And to be frank with you, after hearing that testimony, it was very difficult for me to sleep about what insurance companies do to regular, everyday people, like the people that I represent. We heard from a Mr. Potter, Wendell Potter, and let me just give you some of the words that he said. He said, well, for weeks now, and I quote, we've been hearing industry executives saying the same things and making the same assurances. And I am sure you will hear the same refrain tomorrow. This time, though, the industry is bigger, richer, and stronger. And, and it has a much tighter grip on our health care system than ever before. In the 15 years since the insurance companies killed the Clinton plan, the industry has consolidated to the point that it is now dominated by a cartel of large for-profit insurers. The average family doesn't even understand how Wall Street dictates, determine whether they will be offered coverage and whether they can keep it and how much they'll be charged for it. But in fact, Wall Street plays, and I continue to quote, a powerful role. The top priority of for-profit companies is to drive up the value of their stock. Stocks fluctuate based on companies' quarterly reports which are discussed every three months in conference calls with investors and analysts. Continuing to quote, on these calls, Wall Street investors and analysts look for two key figures, earnings per share and the medical loss ratio or medical benefit ratio, as some companies now call it. That is the ratio between what the company actually pays out and claims and what it has left over to cover sales, marketing, underwriting, and other administrative expenses, and of course, profits. And I'll end it there. Basically, what they were telling us is that too many people are paying loyally year after year after year, but when they want the insurance company to pay, the, the insurance companies quite often slap them in the face and say, no, we are going to up the, your, uh, we're going to give you a rescission we are going to find the pre-existing condition so we can save money. But one of the things that was most chilling was the testimony that came when they told us that quite often these panels in the insurance companies get together and they wait out people while they're sick. They wait out while they're trying to get a decision and, and quite often they wait so they can die. That's what we heard in here yesterday. And I said to them at that time that if that is the case, then that is fraud and it is criminal. And we, as a country, can do better than that. And so I look forward to the testimony, of Mr. Chairman, and with that, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes Mr. Tierney of Massachusetts. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't intend to take my full five minutes except to note that uh, you've all heard a little bit about the testimony we've been hearing from individuals, and I hope you take a moment rather than to read any pro forma statements that you may have made uh, to address in particular uh, issues like the medical loss ratio. Uh, can you explain how it is as medical costs rise faster than inflation, uh, companies still manage to keep the same ratio, the medical loss ratio, meaning that they're putting less money into actual medical care uh, and more money into profits, into salaries for executives, and into underwriting. And when it gets to underwriting, I think we'd like to hear a little bit about uh, why it is that other executives from firms like yours came before Congress and said that they would not do away with such practices like rescission, where somebody is ill and getting treatment only to find out the company then reaches back and tells them to disqualify for some reason, uh, or why it is that you won't uh, stop the practice of pre-existing conditions unless you're regulated to do it, uh, or why it is you continue to put caps on coverage. 
It is all of those reasons and things that lead this Congress to think that the only protection we can have for consumers is to put up a viable competitor against your companies to make them behave and to make them come back and do more for consumers and less for their own self-interest and Wall Street's self-interest. I see, and, and we heard testimony yesterday about all sorts of new plans that you have coming out, voluntary benefits, limited medical uh, benefits. And the voluntary usually means that employees are going to pay 100 percent of the premiums uh, and that they uh, really the employers pay nothing. Well, limited benefit plans mean that they are provided limited coverage, maybe prescription drugs or maybe some lab work and x-rays, maybe a few doctor's visits. But essentially the premiums are again paid entirely for by the employees. Those monthly premiums are usually 30 to 50 percent less than medical major uh, medical plans. Uh, and the employees get left holding the bag because they are not really covered in the end. And I know that some of your companies are, are sponsoring a medical conference in Los Angeles next month promoting those types of plans. And I want you to address for us how you think that is that it helps small businesses. Uh, you say that they are doing it because you can't afford it when, in fact, you are the ones that set the rates. You determine how high you are going to raise the premiums on other policies, driving them into policies like this for the small business employees. Uh, my small businesses aren't impressed with it uh, and they don't want to go in that direction. They want their employees to have good, solid coverage. So I hope you answer all of those questions and I, I look forward to your testimony and maybe discussion afterwards uh, of the, I think, the sorry direction uh, that we are going in the private health care industry and, and you can, maybe you can convince us why it is not essential uh, that we do something in terms of regulation and competition uh, to put a stop to those practices which really haven't uh, shown or reflected well on your industry. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If there are no further opening statements, uh, we will proceed to receive testimony from the witnesses before us today. I want to start by introducing our first panel. Mr. Richard Collins, welcome Mr. Collins. Mr. Collins is the Senior Vice President of Underwriting, Pricing and Healthcare Economics at United Healthcare Group. He also serves as CEO of Golden Rule Insurance Company and President of United Health One, United Healthcare's individual line of business. He served in these capacities since July 2005. Mr. Collins also manages the individual business of American Medical Security Life Insurance Company and Pacific Care. Next, uh, Mr. Brian Sassy. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Mr. Sassy is President and CEO of the Consumer Business Unit for WellPoint, Inc. Mr. Sassy is responsible for the company's senior, state-sponsored, and individual under 65 businesses. Previously, Mr. Sassy was President of the Blue Cross of California and Chief Executive Officer of its Life and Health Affiliate. He also served as Vice President of Operations and Strategic Initiatives for Blue Cross of California and general manager of small group accounts for the West Region for WellPoint Incorporated, the parent company of Blue Cross of California. Thank you. Ms. Patricia A. Farrell. Welcome, Ms. Farrell. <coughs> Ms. Farrell is Senior Vice President of National and International Business Solutions for Aetna Incorporated, leading divisions which provide health insurance for the federal government, TRICARE, and state Medicaid programs and other businesses in the U.S. and abroad. Previously, she was the Senior Vice President of Aetna Specialty Products and Medicaid. This included Aetna Dental, Life, Disability, Long-Term Care, and Voluntary Products, and Aetna's Medicaid and Children's Health Insurance Program business. Ms. Farrell has also served as Senior Vice President for Strategic Planning. Uh, Mr. James H. Blome, is that correct, the pronunciation? Bloom. 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 Mr. James H. Bloom. Mr. Bloom is Senior Vice President, Chief Financial Officer and Treasurer for Humana Incorporated. He has primary responsibility to supervise all accounting, actuarial, analytical, financial, tax, risk management, treasury, and investor relations activities for that company. Thank you for being here. Mr. Thomas Richards. Appreciate your attendance here, Mr. Richards. Mr. Richards is Senior Vice President for Product Management and New Product Development for Cigna Healthcare and Cigna's Choice Link subsidiary, which provides customer benefits and online enrollment. 
Previously, Mr. Richards ran Cigna's Stop Loss Business, which provides reinsurance to middle market and national segment customers. During his career, Mr. Richards has held a variety of product management positions in Cigna Healthcare, including in Cigna's healthcare, Cigna Healthcare's marketing department, where he helped design and bring to market preferred provider organization products and networks. And finally, Ms. Colleen Retton, Retin. Ms. Retin is Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of Healthcare Service Corporations, where she's responsible for its internal operations, as well as numerous divisions of the company, including subscriber services, government services, enterprise information strategy and management, and financial services, among others. Previously, Ms. Retin was President and Chief Operating Officer of Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Minnesota. 20 years of experience in the health insurance field. She was also the co-creator of the Minnesota Health Information Exchange, a national model for sharing electronic health information. Uh, I want to uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Retun, for appearing. And I want to thank all the witnesses for appearing before our subcommittee today. I have to say, in, in just these first few minutes in looking out at you and in looking at your accomplishments in, in the insurance industry. Uh, this hearing is not in any of the questions that are asked. This isn't about anything personal. We respect who you are. But the institutions that you represent are here to be questioned today and challenged today. And we're going to need your cooperation in, in understanding your business model. Now, with that, uh, I will proceed to the swearing in. It's the policy of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform to swear in all witnesses before they testify. I would ask that uh, you please rise, each of the witnesses, and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect that each of the witnesses uh, stood, raised their right hand, and answered in the affirmative. Uh, you may be seated. Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, Mr. Cummings. Mr. Chairman, just a point of information. Mr. Chairman, you just um, swore in the witnesses. Um, should a witness fail to be truthful with this committee, is there a penalty connected with that? Uh, s staff attorneys have uh, just handed this to me. This is pretty um, pro forma for any uh, congressional hearing uh, where witnesses testify and swear under oath. Uh, there's two sections covered. One is uh, uh, 18 U.S.C. Section uh, 1001, uh, which relates to um, uh, knowingly and willfully uh, falsifying uh, uh, any statement. Uh, there, there are provisions uh, in this for penalties that include uh, fine and, and imprisonment. Uh, the, um, uh, there's another section I was given, uh, 2 U.S.C. Section 194, that relates to congressional and committee procedure uh, if anyone uh, fails to uh, answer any question pertinent. Uh, we, would, we would have to, according to this, um, certify uh, through the House of Representatives uh, the facts uh, as we see them to the United States Attorney's Office. So, I, I, you know, it's a, it's a standard uh, operating procedure in this committee, Mr. Cummings, that, uh, you know, we expect witnesses to tell the truth, but if they don't, there are penalties under law. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Um, let's go to opening statements. Uh, Uh, Mr. Collins, uh, you may begin with your opening statement. Thank you. And, and make sure that mic is closed so we can hear what you have to say. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Kucinich, Ranking Member Jordan, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Richard Collins. I'm the head of underwriting, pricing, and healthcare economics for United Healthcare. 
I'm also the CEO of Golden Rule Insurance Company, a United Health Group company that provides individual health insurance to individuals and their families. Today I'll start with some relevant facts about United Health Group, our industry, and try to demonstrate how we are improving the quality of health care while reducing costs and streamlining administration. First, United Health Group provides high quality health services and products for more than 70 million people in partnership with 5,000 doctors, 5,000 hospitals, and 600,000 doctors across all 50 states. Second, we employ 75,000 committed and dedicated men and women. These people work hard to improve the health care and well being of our health plan members. Third, we have prudently managed our finances during these challenging economic times and can back the promises that we make to our stakeholders. Fourth, our industry is already one of the most highly regulated in the United States. United Health Group has long advocated for comprehensive, bipartisan health care reform. We have proposed constructive changes that would ensure rates do not vary because of health status and gender, and would guarantee coverage regardless of pre-existing conditions for those that maintain continuous coverage. These reforms would also require that individuals obtain and maintain health insurance coverage so that everyone participates in both the benefits and the costs of the system. Discussions of administration processes and health begin with benefits of a strong provider network. Our members receive great value from our extensive network, which includes more than 85 percent of the physicians and hospitals in the United States. We perform periodic credential reviews to make sure that network physicians and hospitals continue to meet standards of quality. Our members receive negotiated savings and discounts when they are cared for by one of our contracted providers. A key element to the success of this network is health information technology that we use to increase the speed and accuracy of claim processing. We pay more than 250 million claims annually, and more than 95 are processed on our primary commercial platform within 10 days. In fact, over 80 percent are processed automatically. Across our entire business, we have identified 100,000 physicians through our premium designation program that consistently deliver quality in accordance with evidence-based standards. And they do so at costs 10 to 20 percent below their peers. These physicians use data, efficient practice management, and evidence-based medicine to guide and consistently improve patient care plans, cancer, and congenital heart disease. This helps the sickest patients receive the best possible care, often resulting in better outcomes and often at prices. At Partnerships with physicians and hospitals local physician advisory committees. They provide us with feedback and help us ensure that we maximize the health care quality and minimize the administrative burden. We are also introducing innovative and practical tools that allow doctors and nurses and other health care providers to spend more time with their patients and less on paperwork. For instance, our eSync program synchronizes a person's medical history to help identify gaps in care that they should be receiving. Electronic medical records and e-prescribing technology help physicians uh, practice better medicine through clinical decision support and reduce administrative costs through automation and web-based transactions. In conclusion, United Health Group provides critical services and support at every point in the health care delivery system. We are privileged to serve our members and take seriously our responsibilities to serve uh, uh, Americans in the socially sensitive area of health care. Through innovative technology and programs, as well as close collaboration with the provider community, we are successfully improving quality, reducing costs, and making the, the administration of health care more efficient. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Collins. Mr. Sassy, you're recognized for five minutes. You may proceed. Make sure you can bring that mic close enough. Thank you, Chairman Kucinich, Ranking Member Jordan, and members of the subcommittee for allowing me to testify before you today. I'm Brian Sassy, President and CEO of the Consumer Division of WellPoint. WellPoint provides insurance and health benefits to 35 million people across the country, representing almost one in nine Americans. We recognize we have the ability to help change health care for the better, and with this ability comes a responsibility to our members and to all Americans to advance health care quality, safety, and affordability. I look forward to discussing how WellPoint helps create health care value for our customers. At WellPoint, we developed evidence-based medical policy based on the latest clinical research. 
Our nurses and other healthcare professionals support our members to ensure that care is safe, necessary, and timely. And looking to the future, we continue to explore new ways to reward value over volume and stress safety, efficiency, and patient satisfaction. One of the areas under discussion in the current healthcare reform debate is health plan administrative costs. Last year, PricewaterhouseCoopers conducted an analysis of how the typical health insurance premium dollar is spent. My written testimony includes a chart that shows that 87 cents of every premium dollar is paid out to cover the cost of health care claims. Of the remaining 13 cents, 6 cents goes towards taxes, other government payments, claims processing, and other administrative costs. 4 cents go to consumer services such as care coordination, disease prevention, chronic care management, provider support, and marketing and only three cents of premium dollars remains for profit or surplus. I understand the subcommittee is interested in knowing how we determine medical policy and how our medical policy relates to how we process our members' health care claims. Our medical policies reflect input from premier academic institutions and experts within the medical profession, as well as considera considering the standards of care within our local communities. These medical policies are available online to all providers and to the public at large. Last year, WellPoint received 380 million claims, and we processed 97 percent of those in 30 days. The subcommittee's letter asked for some information on deferral of claims. I should note that we do not defer claims. What happens sometimes is that claims are pending as we await additional information or conduct additional reviews. Some common reasons for pending claims are that premiums have not been paid, that the claim is incomplete, such as missing diagnosis codes, or when members have health coverage, uh, other health coverage that may be primary. The subcommittee's letter also asked about administrative costs. Our administrative costs include a variety of initiatives designed to promote the health and well-being of our members. For instance, WellPoint employees thousands of health professionals, including nurses, dietitians, social workers, and pharmacists, among others. These professionals speak with thousands of members each day, encouraging them to learn more about their conditions and how they can better manage their care. Our health professionals help members schedule necessary follow-up care and specialist care, remind them to pick up important prescriptions, and serve as a valuable resource to our members 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Another example of our clinical is our clinical research subsidiary, HealthCore, which has produced noteworthy studies on best practices for treating low back pain, high cholesterol, asthma, to name just a few. We take these recommendations and share them with physicians to help them improve our members' health. HealthCore works, uh, also works with the FDA and the CDC to improve drug and vaccine safety and has created a sentinel system that helps these agencies monitor emerging drug safety issues in real time. My written testimony includes more detail of these types of initiatives, which are typically not included in government-run programs. Efforts like these, funded out of our administrative expenses, are critical to our ability to follow through on our primary commitment, which is to improve the lives of the people we serve and the health of our communities. In closing, I would like to assure the subcommittee that WellPoint supports responsible health care reform. But reform must go beyond the insurance marketplace to address system-wide challenges and associated costs. Changing how we finance health care without changing how we deliver health care would be incomplete reform at best. I appreciate the opportunity to testify before you today and to respond to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Sassy. The chair recognizes Ms. Farrell. You may proceed for five minutes. Good afternoon. My name is Pat Farrell, and I'm a senior vice president at Aetna. Aetna is one of the nation's leading insurance companies providing medical, dental, pharmacy, disability, life insurance, and other health benefits. We provide those products and services in all 50 states, and we provide those products and services to 37 million Americans. I'm proud to have worked at Aetna for over 20 years in a variety of capacities. On behalf of the thousands of employees at Aetna, I look forward to talking to you today about the value we bring to the healthcare system and in discussing Aetna's commitment to reforming the healthcare system. The Aetna of today is a healthcare solutions company that America, help Americans manage their health care and get the most out of their health care dollar. 
Since 2005, Aetna has called for a major fundamental reform of the insurance market so that all Americans have guaranteed access to affordable coverage with no exclusions for pre-existing conditions. This, combined with the requirement that everyone have insurance coverage and financial assistance for those who can't afford it <clears throat> and who need it, will get and keep everyone covered in our system. I expect that many of the issues we'll discuss today will illustrate the need for reform. Aetna is committed to health reform that address addresses access, affordability, and quality. We operate in a dynamic and highly competitive marketplace. Our business can only be successful when healthcare consumers are confident that we can provide the greatest value for their healthcare dollar and helping them improve or maintain their healthcare status. Our employees come to work every day, doctors, nurses, and customer service professionals with the same commitment to make sure our members get the best healthcare coverage possible. Much of our focus during the health care reform debate has been on building what works well in the employer-sponsored market today, while addressing the problems in the small group market and in the individual marketplace. These solutions, which now seem to be broadly accepted, should go a long way to addressing the problem of access to health insurance. But we strongly believe that for health care reform to be enduring and affordable in a nation, we must address the underlying problem of rising health care costs. Health care costs drive insurance premiums, not the other way around. Over the last decade, health care costs have risen about 7.5%, and premiums have risen that very same amount. It's fundamental to our discussion today to understand the value that Aetna brings to the health care system and how our business practices are focused on empowering consumers and health care providers to make the best decisions possible. We process hundreds of millions of claims every year, and getting them right every single time is our goal. We recognize even a small percentage of problems represent real issues for our customers and for our providers. When we do get it wrong, we have processes in place to help get it back on track quickly. Aetna is driving innovation to improve the lives and the health of our members. In just the past four years, we've invested over $1.8 billion in health information technology. For example, some of that investment went to having personal health records that can empower consumers' decisions around their health. Finally, we're also leaders in promoting wellness and prevention and the management of chronic diseases. Refocusing our system to prevent disease and promote wellness can lead to better health for all Americans and positively in impact costs system-wide. I believe the, the, the competitive marketplace has played and should continue to play an important role in fostering the innovation that's necessary for our country to achieve true and widespread quality and affordability in our health care system. Thank you, and I look forward to continuing to work with Congress to pass health care reform this year. Thank you, Ms. Farrell. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Bloom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And make sure that mic is close. Uh, we we want to hear your Better now? Go ahead. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Jordan, members of the subcommittee, I'm James H. Bloom. I'm a senior vice president, and I'm the chief financial officer and treasurer of Humana, Inc. Humana is a health benefits company headquartered in Louisville, Kentucky, offering health benefit plans for employer groups, government programs, and individuals. We have 10.3 million medical members and 6.8 million specialty members in all 50 states, in Washington, D.C., and in Puerto Rico. Humana employs 28,600 employees and contracts with nearly 400,000 physicians around the country. We provided extensive written testimony on today's subject matter, and I will briefly summarize a few key points here. Every aspect of Humana's operations is governed by federal and or state laws and regulations, and Humana continues to both support and advocate for responsible health system reform. We believe that doing nothing is, an, is, doing nothing is not an option. We believe that all Americans should have affordable quality health coverage. It's essential that everyone participate in the health system with subsidies for those who can't afford coverage, and in return, coverage should be guaranteed and not based on pre-existing conditions or health status. To ensure affordability, 
reform must focus on improving health outcomes, reducing variations in care, and reducing costs. Humana also supports America's Health Insurance Plan's comprehensive reform plan, which provides for universal coverage with, insur with insurance rating reforms. These reforms, voluntarily offered, will obviate the need for business practices that were put into place because there currently is no requirement that individuals have health insurance coverage. The subcommittee has specifically requested that we comment on our processes for both coverage determination and processing claims, as well as the physician feedback on these, on these processes. For 2009, Humana ranked number one among national payers as the easiest to do business for both doctors and hospitals. Specifically, Athena Health found Humana to have the lowest denial rate among all major payers. In contrast, Medicare Part B, the Medicare Part B program ranked fifth. Humana also ranked as the fastest payer to physicians, with the Medicare Part B program again ranking in fifth place. The subcommittee also asked that we address how Humana makes coverage decisions. Let me summarize. Coverage decisions are based on evidence-based medical criteria developed and approved by physicians. Under our policy, a nurse or a non-clinician can authorize any service that's under review. However, only a licensed board certified physician medical director can issue a denial based on a medical criterion. To the extent that a practicing physician disagrees with a decision, there are timely internal appeal processes allowing peer-to-peer -peer input. These grievance and appeal processes are governed by state and federal regulations. Internal appeal decisions can be further appealed to an independent external review entity whose decision is binding on Humana. Humana has worked effectively over the past few years to streamline and simplify our administrative practices. We've partnered closely with the hospitals and physicians who care for our members and our members themselves. Here's one example. Availity is an industry-leading multi-payer, multi-use electronic medical provider information exchange. Humana co-founded Availity with the Blues of Florida. It fulfills the President's and Congress's call for a workable healthcare information technology superhighway. It has standardization, speed, accuracy, transparency, and it results in significant cost savings. Today across the country, 50,000 physicians, 1,000 hospitals, 100 million members, and a thousand payers, including public payers, access or connect with Availity every year. This results in a pro this will result this year in approximately 600 million transactions. Availity, what it does is provide seamless provider interactions and improves patient safety, saving money. It has digitized most of the non-standard administrative processes that providers have complained about for years. And for those who use e-prescribing, preventable drug, adverse drug events have been reduced by 61%. And most importantly, there are no charges to providers for using Availity. In closing, Mr. Chairman, let me say that Humana is committed to continue to work closely with the administration and Congress to increase the likelihood that measures designed to solve the most significant problems in our health care system become the focal points of responsible and real health reform efforts. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bloom. The Chair recognizes Mr. Richards. You may proceed for five minutes. Thank you. Chairman Kucinich, Ranking Member Jordan, and members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the opportunity to address the subcommittee and to discuss the issues raised in your letter to Mr. Hamway on August 26th. My name is Tom Richards, and I am the Senior Vice President of Product for Cigna Corporation, which is based in Philadelphia. At the outset, I want to emphasize, on behalf of the 26,000 Cigna employees, that we support health care reform that provides security, affordability, and stability for all Americans. We believe such a goal is achievable by strengthening the current system to include both a personal coverage requirement and a helping hand for those who can't afford coverage. We support guaranteed coverage for everyone and no exclusion for any pre-existing condition. We support reforms in the way premiums are calculated without taking into consideration health status or gender. 
We support providing subsidies to individuals who have difficulty affording health insurance, including subsidies to small businesses. We support administrative standardization and simplification. We support a focus on health and wellness. Further, we support the establishment of exchanges to provide a choice of plan options for all Americans. We also support reimbursement reforms to the current fee-for-service delivery system. It's also important that you understand Cigna's role in healthcare. While we have some insurance business, nearly 80% of Cigna's healthcare business is administrative services only. This we means we administer the programs for employers in accordance with their policies and pay claims for them. It is not risk-based, as would be traditional insurance. These employers are self-insuring and the claim payments come out of their employer funds. There is no financial incentive for our employees to accept or deny claims. At Cigna in 2008, 89 cents of each premium dollar was spent on medical care. Our support for reform is aligned with what we stand for as a company. Our mission is to improve the health, well-being, and sense of security of the customers we serve. Our results demonstrate our focus on health improvement. Competitive data from NCQA's 2008 State of Healthcare Quality report shows this difference. Against a baseline of standard care provided by doctors and hospitals in a fee-for-service unmanaged situation, we have better results. If you turn to figure one on page four of my written testimony, you'll see a chart that reflects these results. All of our coverages, all of our coverage policies follow best practices and are evidence-based, which means they're based on the most recently published scientific evidence. We consider safety and effectiveness. It's important to note that cost is not a factor unless there are multiple items or services with equivalent safety and effectiveness. We are very proud to employ over 3,000 clinicians. These doctors and nurses make decisions about clinical policy, review medical necessity, and advocate for individuals. They make the system easier to understand. They help our customers navigate the healthcare system when they need help, and they literally save lives. We have included the words of several of these individuals in our written testimony, telling you how we have helped them. In 2008, Cigna processed approximately 91 million claims for payment. More than 90 million of these claims were paid without question. I call your attention to figure two on page 10 of the written testimony. Of the approximately 1 million claims that did require prior authorization, all but 0.08% were approved on initial review. What that means is that Cigna, more than 99.9% .9 of the time, the person received the care that the doctor recommended and the services were covered. At Cigna, all medical coverage decisions are made by doctors and nurses and ultimately the chief medical officer is responsible for all coverage decisions. We recognize the doctor-patient relationship is critical and do everything we can to enhance it. Let me cite just a few examples. First, Cigna is simplifying and reducing administrative complexities from payment methodologies and claim processing to problem resolution and education. Second, Cigna is further innovating our payment methodologies. An example of this is, our, is Cigna's patient-centered medical home initiative such as the one we have with Dartmouth-Hitchcock in New Hampshire. Our joint goal is to improve patient access, continuity, and coordination of care, quality of care for patients, and lower medical costs for everyone. At Cigna, we focus on helping people improve their health. We believe that health care is a shared responsibility of the individual, the private sector, the medical community, and the government. Such a shared responsibility is right for individuals, families, and the country as a whole. We look forward to how we can work together to improve the health and wellness and quality of care for all Americans. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my remarks. Thank you very much, Mr. Richards. The chair recognizes Ms. Reedon. Thank you. Please proceed for five minutes. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Jordan, and members of the subcommittee. I'm Colleen Retan. I'm the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of Healthcare Service Corporation. We are a mutual legal reserve corporation that does business as the Blue Cross Blue Shield plans in Illinois, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Texas. By way of background, HCSC is the largest customer-owned health insurance company in the nation. We are not investor-owned. We are a customer-owned mutual. We have a workforce of more than 16,000 employees serving 12.3 million members through our Blue Cross plans in those four states. Our mission is to promote the health and wellness of healthcare 
for our members and the communities that we serve through accessible, cost-effective, high-quality care. Prior to joining HCSC in 2008, I was the President and Chief Operating Officer of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Minnesota, that state's largest health insurer, and they are a not-for-profit health plan. I have 28 years of experience in the Blue Cross system. The areas of accountability I have within HCSC is for management of our Subscriber Services Division, which processes member claims and handles health care inquiries. I'm also responsible for information technology, finance, and actuarial functions. We certainly recognize and share the public's concern with the current health care system, but fundamentally, we believe in the strength and the value of the American health care system. We believe that insurers, like HCSC, are uniquely positioned to help foster and inform improvements to the health care system, and we, we really welcome the opportunity to serve in that role. HCSC has been an advocate of health care reform. To that end, we support the proposition that health insurance companies are required to offer coverage to all applicants require of their current, regardless of their current health status, coupled with a personal responsibility for all Americans to obtain and maintain coverage. Second, we support subsidies for those Americans who cannot afford health care coverage. Third, we support health and wellness initiatives that focus on the prevention of chronic illness. And finally, we support initiatives that promote effective care and treatment and for information technologies that improve quality and provide value for every health care dollar. We're pleased to share with the subcommittee some examples of how HCSC has incorporated evidence-based approach into medical policy into two key tenets that underpin the core values of our company and that of access and quality. My written statement outlines our approach in each of these areas in greater detail, but a few items are just worth noting before the discussion today. First, our members need access to proven medical care. One of HCSC's four guiding principles is our belief that the interest of our members are of primary importance to our company. The members we serve provide the reason for our existence and the rationale for the resources with which we operate. Secondly, but equally important, is to continually improve the quality of care. Another of our guiding principles is our belief that we, as representatives of our members, have an obligation to provide leadership in the healthcare field. We're promoting evidence-based medicine to increasingly focus our plans around proven healthcare services. We also work closely with our very broad network of doctors and hospitals to invest in data sharing technology that works to improve clinical decision making and these efforts help improve quality and ensure that doctors and hospitals treat patients effectively and get paid efficiently. HCSC is committed to working with the administration and Congress to achieve comprehensive health care reform, to expand access and improve quality of care for all Americans. On behalf of our company and its members, I thank the subcommittee for the opportunity to discuss these important issues today. Thank you very much for your, your testimony. Uh, without objection, the chair and the ranking member will proceed for uh, 10 minutes each for questions, and then uh, each member after that will have five minutes, so we may have uh, several rounds. We'll see how it goes. The only thing I want to uh, share with the uh, members of the panel here is this. Uh, members of Congress generally like to get answers, and uh, if you're able to give us a brief answer and, and it covers the territory, that's fine. Uh, if you start to go on and on on something, uh, I, I don't want to appear confrontational, but I may have to encourage you to hurry up your answer or, or you know, may even have to cut you off. I don't want to do that, but I do want you to know that we are here to get answers and we need your help. So uh, without objection, I'll begin. I just want to add one other thing. We may be joined by other members of Congress who are not members of this committee. Uh, that's not unusual uh, and without objection. Uh, if other members of the uh, uh, choose to come here from either side of the aisle, even though they're not on this committee, without objection, we'll permit them to sit in, to participate, and to ask questions. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to start the questioning with uh, Mr. Sassy of WellPoint. Uh, sir, in your testimony, you state, quote, last year WellPoint received 380 million claims and processed 97 percent of them within 30 days. Now, I'm looking at the arithmetic. And if the arithmetic is correct, it means that you did not pay 
within 30 days over 11 million claims. Would you tell the subcommittee uh, what uh, is the value in dollars to WellPoint of the 11 million claims that uh, were not paid in that time period? Um, I, Chairman, I don't know the value of that. Uh, can, can, you, can you provide the subcommittee with such information? There has to be a way to calculate it. Um, I, I'm not sure because that is at a point in time. The vast majority of those claims most likely were paid at a future point, either on the 31st day or if we had requested additional information well, maybe, that was provided and then subsequently paid. Maybe you could then chart out 30 days, 60, 90. Businesses operate that way, of course, you know, 120. And maybe if you could provide us information with what was the average cost of each claim that you did not immediately pay. It would be helpful. You could either look at it as a cost or a value, but yeah, and, and we'll follow up with written questions so okay. we can keep going. Okay. We're not going to. Thank you. We're not going to uh, belabor that. Uh, Mr. Sassy, on a 2008 earnings conference call with Wall Street, your CEO said the following quote: "We will not sacrifice profitability for membership." As you know, WellPoint was forced to pay. $15 million last year to settle claims or charges by the California Department of Insurance that you removed coverage from 2,330 members after they submitted claims for expensive medical care. I'm going to submit for the record the article on the settlement from the Los Angeles Times from February of this year. WellPoint settled similar charges the previous year and paid a $10 million fine for removing coverage from 1,770 members of its HMOs in California. Uh, Mr. Sassy, is dropping members uh, just when they need health care what your CEO meant when she said that she wouldn't sacrifice profitability for membership? Uh, absolutely not. Um, well, I what believe, did she mean then? I, I believe what was meant was that we would not reduce uh, prices artificially to essentially buy membership in the open marketplace. And, and Mr. Sassy, what characteristics did those uh, 2,330 individuals have in common that resulted in WellPoint's decision to drop members just as their medical bills threatened to reduce WellPoint's profitability? Uh, that settlement pertained to uh, a settlement agreement that we reached with the Department of Managed Health Care and the Department of Insurance in California relative to rescissions in the individual marketplace. Um, I'm sure you're aware that companies agree to settle lawsuits or um, situations for a variety of reasons. And, um, but you know, you're in front of a congressional committee here. Uh, there's, y y unless your counsel is advising you that you can't answer that question, you, you should answer the question. I, I did answer the question, sir. Well, you, you, you didn't really say what characteristics those individuals had in common. Uh, that resulted in WellPoint's decision to drop members because their medical bills threatened to reduce profitability. You did not answer the question. I was just in the book and move. You answer the question. Those authors were rescinded in the individual market because they uh, materially misrepresented um, their medical history on their insurance application at the time that they applied for coverage. Okay. Now, how did WellPoint discipline the executives who? Um, committed the practices that led to the enforcement action against you? Well, we, we did not uh, admit, we did not with the findings of the Department of Managed Health Care. That's on public record. They did issue a report. We did append a report um, to that. Um, the settlement, you know, we agreed to settle with the Department okay, of Managed I, Health I Care um, to put the issue behind us. Uh, Ms. Mr. Collins. In United Healthcare Group's Social Responsibility Report in 2008, your CEO writes, quote, the businesses of United Health Group are fundamentally organized around advancing our mission to people to live healthier lives, unquote. Now, if your business is fundamentally organized around that mission, will you explain United Healthcare's settlement of charges last year that its Pacific Care subsidiary wrongfully denied 130,000 claims in California? paid claims incorrectly, lost documents that included medical records, failed to acknowledge claims in a timely manner, and hassled its members with multiple requests for documentation that was previously provided. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, we uh, 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 
are, are vigorously contesting the findings of the state. Uh, I do not contest that, that uh, there is room for improvement in our California operations. We have uh, put a lot of resources into improving our operations and we regret inconvenience and, and, uh, uh, to our membership. But uh, I, I do not think our aspiration to provide um, uh, products, services, um, and uh, financing of the health care of American, Americans as uh, inconsistent, uh, uh, inconsistent with our behavior. Well, uh, you, okay, then, you know, that's, uh, that's fine. I, I mean, you've, you've answered that question. But in 2007, what was the compensation of the top executives at Pacific Care? Uh, well, in, in 2007, sir, Pacific Care was a wholly owned subsidiary of United Healthcare, so the top executives would have been the top executives of United Health Group. Well, and that's public record, sir. Was the compensation possibly in millions? Well, I don't have those numbers off the top of my head, We provide them but to this committee? Absolutely. They are public record in our 10-K, sir. And, and so, you know, other members may have this question, but I think it would be great if each of you could provide us that compensation information of officers uh, um, and also information about bonuses and incentives received by Pacific Care executives and employees that would have uh, rewarded the denial of claims in California in 2006, 2007. We want to see if there is any connection there, and we, we need that information. if if you can cooperate and provide it. Uh, I'm confident, sir, that there was no uh, bonuses awarded for denial of claims or, or other activity that was uh, um, uh, illegal. And as I said before, we are vigorously contesting the findings of the Department and the characterization of the, uh, of the uh, actions there as denial of claims. Thank you, Mr. Collins. Uh, Mr. Richards of Cigna, on page 8 of your written testimony, you state, we do not consider costs in establishing coverage policy in our decisions to provide access to care. But we heard from a former senior executive with Cigna who told us yesterday that Cigna has meetings every quarter, which are called town hall meetings, uh, internal town hall meetings, in which executives go over the past quarters, financial statements, and talk about how they can tighten utilization to lower the share of Cigna's premium income spent on medical expenses. Uh, isn't it true that Cigna has held internal town hall meetings at which those topics are discussed? It's absolutely true that we hold town hall meetings to communicate with our employees, to reinforce our mission, and to talk about our financial results. And, and those town hall meetings are videotaped. They, are they not and audio taped? Um, I do not believe they are videotaped. We certainly are do audio -taped? tape them so that uh, individual employees can, who are not able to attend are able but, but to. But are there audio tapes available? Yes, they are. I would uh, like you to provide this subcommittee with copies of those audio tapes and any videotapes that you have. Uh, our staff will work with you to achieve the... Uh, Again, what I would like to emphasize, Mr. Chairman, is those internal meetings are uh, to communicate to our employees. That I, I understand. To and we, and I understand that they are. And we are no, uh, we'll be in touch with you regarding our request that we get those audio tapes. And I just would like to conclude with this question for each and every one of you. The premise of this hearing is that health insurers wield strong influence in the kind of care, whether there is care, for their policyholders who become very sick. According to the American Cancer Society, and this is a quote, Cancer patients and survivors may delay or forego care in the face of cost sharing that they find difficult to afford. A recent study found that 5 percent of non-elderly adults with private health insurance who have been diagnosed with a chronic condition such as cancer reported they went without needed care in 2006. It's the American Cancer Society saying this. I want to give you a chance to express for the record what you think on this, about this question and really with a simple yes or no answer. And we're going to go down the line and I want you to answer this question. Do you believe that a health insurer's refusal to pay for a patient's cancer treatment can directly or indirectly cause harm or death to that patient? I'm going to ask the question one more time. Do you believe that a health insurer's refusal to pay for a patient's cancer treatment can directly or indirectly cause harm or death to that person. I'd like to go right down the line, Mr. Collins, and just give me a simple answer. Go all the way down the line, then my question time is completed. Mr. Collins. Uh, yes, sir. Pardon? Yes, sir. 
Uh, Mr. Sassy. Yes, sir. Ms. Farrell. Yes. Mr. Bloom. Yes. Mr. Richards. Yes, but SIGNU only allows clinicians to make coverage decisions, and those coverage decisions were, are only based on external scientific evidence. The answer is yes. Okay. Mrs. Uh, Ms. Retton. Yes, sir. Thank you. I want to thank uh, each and every one of you for your candor. Uh, the chair recognizes for uh, 10 minutes, uh, Mr. Jordan of Ohio, you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the chairman's uh, having this here, and I appreciate the chairman's intensity and, and passion that he brings to uh, any debate. But I uh, fundamentally disagree with sort of the underlying premise here, the idea that because there's been some, as I stated in my opening statement, that there's been some problems with, uh, with the way private insurance works, that somehow that should cause us to move to a government-run system. I just fundamentally disagree with that. Frankly, I think the majority of Americans, as pointed out over the last several months, and, and any poll you look at here of, of, of recent date, uh, is, is, would, would, would say the same thing. Uh, so I have really kind of two focuses here in, in, in the few minutes that I have uh, with you. And again, I appreciate you being here. One, I want to get the facts. And then um, I want to get at this idea that I think is fundamental to real reform and what needs to happen in this country. And that is a health care system that empowers the patient. Uh, there's a great, I think, a, a great article in this month's Atlantic which talks about uh, the idea that it's always somebody else who's paying. And when somebody else is paying, that's what, I mean, I think Ms. Farrell said it uh, well. She said insurance premiums don't drive health care costs. Health care costs drive insurance premiums. We've got to get a health care cost. And that only happens when the consumer, the patient, the family, the small business owner out there has, has a better handle on what's happening uh, more transparency so they can they can figure this out and make some real market real market type uh, decisions so let me start with this one of the things we heard yesterday again in, in, in an effort to get to the facts one of the things we heard yesterday was uh, from the panel we had uh, 57 percent of every dollar uh, is all that goes towards uh, health care uh, of, of, of the premiums that you take in and so uh, we heard about the cartels and everything and I'm, I'm actually looking now at, at um, a piece the journal ran uh, this Monday, and they they actually talk about an example in Alabama where it was 92 percent, according to to uh, uh, what's happening in the state of Alabama, where one insurer, one Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alabama, has 70 percent of the market share. So I would like to know, do you agree with that 57 percent figure, and and if not, what what it is in in each of your uh, company's uh, situation? And we'll just go down the list. So, Mr. Collins. Uh, thank you, Congressman Jordan. Uh, the uh, statistics cited in Mr. Stassi's uh, testimony come from a Price Waterhouse Coopers uh, um, study that cites 83 cents on a dollar. That's a credible study. It's a recent study. There's another study that just came out from Sherlock and Company just in the last few weeks, which corroborates the Price Waterhouse study. What's uh, what's but, but what's United? What's your in, what do you say? What do you pay? Well, sir, of every uh, dollar you take in, how much goes for? for uh, patient care? Uh, that's not a real simple answer to, to uh, uh, Is it 57 percent? Is it less? No, is sir. It more? It, it's, uh, it's consistent with the findings in the uh, Sherlock and the uh, Price Waterhouse Coopers. Have you done an stuff. internal investigation? Do you know? Do you have a, you have a good idea what United would be? Uh, sir, it's, it, we, the, uh, the uh, uh, loss ratio for 2008 uh, was approximately uh, 83 percent, 83 and a half okay. percent okay. for the company. But that's across a, a wide uh, spectrum of businesses. Mr. Sasson, well point. Same question? Yeah. Okay. Um, the loss ratio for um, WellPoint plans overall is directionally uh, similar to what I quoted as uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers. Okay. Uh, but as I also stated, uh, loss ratio is just the calculation of premium less claims that, pay, that are paid. And as I also indicated in my testimony, there are a, num a, a fair amount of administrative costs right. that we pay to help manage chronic care, chronic conditions. We pay out of our administrative cost for disease management programs for asthma, heart disease, diabetes, COPD. Uh, to help those 50 percent of Americans that have chronic illness manage their cost. And that's typically not included 
in the loss ratio that's included in administrative expense. Right. So if you're looking for a holistic, what do we spend? Numbers um, higher. It, 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 yeah. it's, it's north of that number. Understand, understand. So, Congressman, uh, at Aetna, we spend uh, 84 cents on the dollar directly on medical claims. Um, the, we do um, spend a fair amount on um, administration relative to innovations in the healthcare industry, making sure that we are providing our members and our providers mm -hmm. with the most recent tools and technologies and information in order to, as you said, give them the tools to, to make them understand what policies they purchased, what's in those policies, Good. Um, so that they can make better decisions on behalf of themselves and their families. Ranking Member Jordan, we pay between uh, 83 and 85 percent over here. the last okay. seven years. Last year was the upper end of the range, around 84.6. Ranking Member Jordan, for Cigna last year, the number was 89 cents. That number has gone up uh, each of the last five years. Good. Our medical care ratio at HCSC is approximately 84 percent. Okay. Let me, let me move to another one. Uh, according to the Congressional Research Service, each year 1 billion claims are submitted to Medicare um, and 10 percent of those claims are denied. So uh, I mean, you think of 10 percent of a that's, that's a lot, 100 million claims denied. Uh, if I got the numbers right when you went through your testimony, I just jotted these down. United, you have 70 million that you insure, well, 35, Aetna 37, Humana, I think you had two different distinctions, but I totaled 16, Cigna 46 here and around the world, and HCSC 12.3 million. So, um, how does your denial rate uh, compare to what the government currently does with the Medicare program? Uh, Congressman, I'm not prepared to answer that question today. I really just don't have those numbers uh, available. Uh, I would like to, to point how out many that claims, we're How many about claims do you have a year? Now, I, I understand Medicare population, older populations, there are going to be significantly more claims, but 70 million people compared to 45 in Medicare. 45 million in Medicare, how many claims do you get a year? I, I don't know exactly. On our primary processing platform, where the vast majority of our claims are processed, as, in my test, as I stated in my testimony, 250 million claims. That 250 million claims, okay. Um, Ranking Mem Member Jordan, I, I don't have the percentage of claims that were uh, denied, if that is the question. We processed 380 million, we received 380 million claims. Uh, the number I, I read was the amount that we processed in 30 days. We processed uh, the remaining. 97 percent in 30 days. Yeah. I got that. Yeah. But I mean, you, you, we heard we heard stories yesterday. So I, there have to be some that are denied. Do, you, oh, do any absolutely. of you know what percentage are denied? Um, I, I don't. Is have it more that than 10 percent? I, I don't have that number. I'm sorry, Ms. Farrell. Uh, we process approximately 407 million claims annually at Aetna. And um, if you look at the reasons why claims, uh, claims are denied, I think what you're trying to get is the, the reason that something might be denied for medical necessity. Mm -hmm. And at Aetna, less than one half of 1% of claims are denied because of medical reasons. Thank you. Ranking Member Jordan, um, I cited the Athena Health Study, which I uh, commented that we ranked first in terms of the lowest, the lowest denial rate. Our denial rate in that survey was 5.7%. Okay. The government in the, the government, the Medicare Part B program. Was fifth, I think you said, yeah. That, that had an 8.7% denial rate for, okay. for fifth place. Okay. Ranking Member Jordan, at Cigna, we have about um, 91 million claims we processed um, last year, and again, 99.9% .9 of those um, were approved um, for the coverage, so it would have been 0.1 percent that were not for the coverage. Good. HCSC processes um, 560,000 560, claims a day, and we deny for the medical necessity coverage three tenths of a percent. Wonderful, uh, Mr. Bloom. In your testimony, you, you talked about some things you were doing to um, make it easier for the folks who you do business with, people you insure, to deal with the same. That's the, you know, one thing you hear from folks in our own lives. You get the statement of benefits. You try to figure out what the heck it says. Um, I think if, if a lot of Americans are like me, they look and if it says it's not a bill, they, they, don't, they kind of file it away and not, not worry about it too much. Um, 
but you talked about some things you're doing. I'd like for you to elaborate on that a little bit because, you know, one of the things we hear from healthcare professionals is they don't like necessarily, the, they don't like the reimbursement rate they get from Medicare, Medicaid, but in some ways it's not as cumbersome as some of the other things you have to do with. So I'm curious what you're doing to, to make it easier for people to deal with uh, and, and figure out what's going on. And, and again, getting at this idea of empowering the patient, which I believe is going to lower the cost. Okay, a, a couple things I mentioned in my written testimony I'd just like to quickly summarize. First of all, when we talk about the, the problems that have existed between um, the various constituencies, obviously we have three people involved. We have us as the payer, we have the, the member, and we have the provider. So to make things simpler and to make things easier, what we've done um, as in Florida, but now throughout the country, is come up uh, with a joint venture that we have with a number of companies that helps providers get instant adjudication, real-time adjudication, in terms of what um, a member's responsibilities, right. what ours are. We're trying to provide certainty against all, for all of our constituencies. The other thing, so the that, providers are liking it, and the patients are liking it. Because it's because it's electronic and it basically right. tells people when they go to the doctor, this is what's going to be expected of you. This is what Humana is going to pay. This is what you're going to pay. Okay. This is what the provider is going to charge. We also, if I could be real brief, we also have a, a document called a smart summary that we mail to the 10 million of the 10.3 million members that we have every quarter. And it basically tells all the claims that they've had, what those claims are for, what doctors, what hospitals they went to, what uh, pharmacy, what drugs they're taking. It gives them sort of a, a quick summary of what their situation was for that quarter, much like you get with uh, right. maybe investment accounts you have. Yeah. I'd be very happy to provide this. If like a quarterly like. statement. That yes. Get on your, yeah. So that people understand that they can begin to have the knowledge that you're talking about in order to take effective control of their health, uh, health status and their insurance. Thank you. Ten minutes goes, goes fast, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all. I, I thank uh, my colleague from Ohio. Uh, we've been joined by uh, two other members, uh, and before we go to Mr. Cummings, I'll introduce uh, Mr. Schock from Illinois and also uh, the distinguished chairman of judiciary, John Conyers, who is the um, author of, he's the author of uh, H.R. 676. I'm always pleased, and I was pleased to work with him on that. Mr. Conyers, we are honored by your presence here. We're going to go right now to, uh, as well as Mr. Shock's present, we're going to go to uh, Mr. Cummings for uh, your questions. Go ahead, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I just want to know how many of you, which of you, if any, and we'll go down the line, give bonuses uh, for folks who deny coverage? Uh, uh, straight down the line. Uh, we don't uh, issue uh, bonuses for people that deny coverage, sir. Is it a part of their evaluation? I'm going to ask each one of you the same question. Is it a part of their evaluation? Those, do, uh, is there any kind of incentives with regard to evaluations regarding denial of coverage, that is, to claims? Uh, I'm sorry, Congressman, without going back and doing research on that topic, I really could not you don't give know you that? a responsive answer up to that question. You don't, you don't know the answer to that question? Is that what you're telling me? Yes, sir. All right. Um, I can tell you that WellPoint does not have any policies in place to reward people for denying care. So there's no policies and you do not do that. Is that correct? It's, it's my understanding we do not. Or physicians. How about physicians D denying yeah, there's, treatment? There are, there are no metrics or anything surrounding denying for, care. Very well. Ms. Farrell? Yeah, only, finish, uh, only physicians can uh, deny a claim at Aetna, and we have absolutely no incentives, financial incentives, tied to that decision-making process. So employees don't either, is that right? I know you said physicians, but what about employees? Well, physicians are the only ones that can actually... In other words, do they ever? Physicians are the only ones who can actually... Did you ever have that policy of, of giving incentives for denying... Uh, claims. You say ever. Um, I, I can't speak for ever. To your knowledge, right. do you, have you? To my knowledge, no. I see your lawyer is trying to advise you. you you're welcome to do so because uh, we, we're going to follow up on this. To Are my you knowledge, finished, Mr. Lawyer? To my knowledge, no. All right. Uh, Mr. Bloom? To my knowledge, during my tenure of eight and a half years, no. All right. It's signal that there are no financial incentives for our clinicians to deny coverage. 
At HCSC, there are no financial incentives and no bonuses paid related to denial of care. Then between today and yesterday, then some, some, apparently there must be some other insurance companies in because the testimony we got yesterday was just the opposite to that. But we'll, we'll go forward. Um, you, uh, very interestingly, you, when you all were answering Mr. Jordan's question, you um, were talking about this whole idea of claims. And Mr. Richards, uh, you in your uh, oral testimony and your written testimony uh, seem, you know, was very proud, and I think you should be, I, I think, of when you said that uh, over 99 percent of the claims are covered and people are receiving the services that the doctor recommended. Is that correct? That's correct. Now, Mr. Richards, um, when you say claim, what do you mean by that? When I refer to that, I'm talking about the uh, determination of whether the particular procedure is covered. In other words, those are services that were already done. Is that right? Uh, actually, a lot of times uh, a physician, the, the uh, individual's physician would check with us prior to the procedure being done under what's called a prior authorization to see if the uh, procedure would be covered. So you are including, when you look at this, when you're giving us this figure, you're telling us that in those cases before services were rendered, um, you include those, and you include those after service were rendered, that you paid, quote, claims. Is that what you mean by claims? Because I'm, I want to make sure we are, you know, uh, going from the same page, because the testimony we got yesterday is that, you know, the industry has a definition for claims, and claims means some services that have already been rendered. And then, the, then, and then you're talking about the now. But a lot of the problems that we heard yesterday were things leading up to that, where the doctor calls. We had one doctor here yesterday said he literally had to double his number of employees just to deal with getting authorization to do, do procedures. So, so just answer my question. Yeah. When you say 99.9%, what do you mean? I mean, of, of, the, of the claims that we get, 99.9% .9 of those are approved um, without any um, need for uh, for appeal. I think, um, I, I, first of all, I appreciate, Congressman, the, um, um, the chance to clarify this because I don't think it's well understood by the public. Um, Cigna and I suspect other insurance companies um, get submitted a lot of claims that are um, duplicates or are that are for people that um, are not insured by Cigna or not covered. Are by those included in this definition? They are not included. So um, if, for instance, somebody, if, for instance, a doctor submitted us a duplicate claim. Um, we'd already received one. Okay, I got the duplicate. What else? See, see you, I um, want to make sure we got fraud, this, this, uh, fraud and abuse. the definition is changed fraud, already. Fraud, so. uh, well, I, um, I understand the committee is interested in both um, what insurance companies are doing relative to medical coverage, which is how I was answering the question, but I also understand you're very interested in um, the administrative procedures, so I'm trying to clarify that. Um, uh, fraud and abuse would be another reason why a claim might be um, denied. And for instance, I know that that's extremely important to Medicare and the Office of the Inspector General. So um, we, for instance, denied um, or, or did not pay um, 250 million claims for fraud and abuse. Now again, these would be situations where the individual has already received the care, but the the doctors uh, or, or providers inappropriately billing for that. And does duplicate, when you say duplicate, do you mean a case where somebody may have been denied and then they no, no, uh, no. try again? No, I mean due to a billing error, um, we would have already, for instance, paid the claim and it was submitted again. Sometimes things cross in the mail, Congressman. So is, is that the only other thing that's in the, the, uh, that may not be included in your uh, denial rate? The, I think those are the, the major categories. The only other thing I might mention is in, in California, um, there's um, a fair number of doctors in California who operate under um, a prepayment mechanism where we pay them a certain month per month or a certain amount per month to cover the care for um, our customers. So that prepaid thing, uh, pre the way that prepayment works is we pay them um, whether the individuals see seek care from that doctor that month or not. We occasionally, we sometimes do get claims from those doctors, again, erroneously for care that we've already paid under the prepayment. And in, in that case, those claims would uh, also not be paid. Gentlemen's time has expired. The chair recognizes the congressman from Illinois, Mr. Schock. You may proceed for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to our distinguished panel here for being here. Uh, unfortunately, I have half the time as the, uh, the chairman and ranking member, so I'm going to try and make this quick. Um, it seems as we, we just 
discuss health care and, and um, the rising costs of health care, um, the focus seems to be on, you know, who's paying for it. And to me, it doesn't matter whether you're a state government providing Medicaid, a federal government providing Medicare, or a private business or individual paying for it privately, the issue is the huge rise in costs. My question to all of you in the private pay business is within your respective organizations, I'm assuming when you negotiate with pay, with, with, with rates to your preferred providers, uh, you ask for some justification in costs. And what there seems to be very little discussion about is the rise in cost. Uh, some of that is true operating cost. In other words, new x-rays, new MRIs, new technologies, staff. And some of the rise in cost is also a cost shift. In other words, the uh, great debate this year is whether or not we should cut Medicare rates by 16 percent. And we seem to pat ourselves on the, the back when we leave and say, well, we didn't, you know, we staved off cuts again this year. Well, we, we may have staved off cuts, but we didn't adequately reimburse the providers for the true increase in their costs, therefore requiring them to shift that cost to those in the private pay industry. So my question to each one of you is, have any of you within your organization looked at the increase in reimbursement rates that you all are required to pay and thus raising your premium rates, what percent of that is a true cost increase in terms of cost to the recipient and what percent of that cost increase is because of cost shifting uh, as a result of the state and federal government not adequately paying for uh, their patients? Mr. Collins. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Congressman. The, uh, Trend in unit costs, so the negotiated rates that we have with providers and doctors has been running in the range of 4.5 to 6 percent for many years now. That's in excess of CPI. I don't know the exact percentage of what our costs are due to cost shifting, but according to a recent uh, Milliman study, uh, Milliman and Robertson, of the, the, uh, the uh, accounting firm, or the uh, actuarial firm, $88 billion a year are cost shifted from Medicare and Medicaid programs to the uh, private sector. Uh, the American Hospital Association and the AMA have, have uh, both uh, published uh, statistics that show uh, that uh, Medicaid programs on average pay uh, uh, less than 90 percent of cost and that Medicare pays less than 100 percent of cost. So there is a cost shifting that has been a uh, constant pressure and uh, it's, it's a uh, it's an uh, ongoing and uh, uh, major driver of unit cost inflation in health Premiums went up on the average of 4 to 6 percent. It's of inflation, our um, uh, utilization increases, tech, new technologies, those sorts of things. But just straight unit cost has been running 4 to 6 And if you looked at what percent of that is cost of doing business and what percent of it is, is, a, is a shift? I'm sorry, sir. I couldn't answer that that precise question, but, but $88 billion over the private sector is a significant amount of money. Yeah. Congressman, I, I would agree with uh, Mr. Collins' uh, comments. Uh, Milliman did publish that study, and it estimated that $88 billion is being cost shifted to the private sector from Medicare mm -hmm. and Medicaid, which equates to about an overall increase across the board for commercial members of about 10 percent or I believe the study says $1,600 per covered member. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be very difficult for us to identify on a facility by facility, doctor by doctor, understanding their entire cost structure, what goes into that, right. to identify at that level. But I believe that the Milliman study is credible. Because I'm tight on time, I'm not going to ask everyone to repeat the same thing. But has anybody done, uh, you know, I'm just, I guess I understand provider by provider, it's not possible to do that. But I didn't know if you've actually looked, done some independent study on you know, a sampling pool of, of uh, preferred providers on, on what, their, what their justification and increase in costs is? Uh, Congressman, um, first of all, I do agree with you. Underpayment of the, by Medicare and Medicaid is um, absolutely a huge problem for hospitals and doctors, and it is definitely um, increasing medical inflation. Cigna has done some analysis of the disparity in the rates between Medicare and Medicaid and, uh, and commercial rates. I don't have that with me, but we would be happy to provide that uh, analysis of the average rates to the committee. Yeah, I, I only have a couple. What is the yellow? Two minutes, one minute? Okay. Uh, one other question, because I'm going to be cut off here. I wish I had more time. Um, 
it, it seems to me, again, as we talk about controlling costs, uh, I found it very interesting. I met with uh, the Consulate General of Canada, and uh, he's very much uh, supportive of, of their Canadian health care system. But one thing I thought was very interesting during our discussion was that he said, you know, Congressman Schock, he said, um, it's still too easy in your country to sue doctors. And I kind of sat back in my chair and I said, excuse me? And he said, well, our health care system in Canada would not be uh, uh, continued to function uh, if comprehensive tort reform were not a part of the health care plan when we passed it in our country. Um, my question, obviously my view on this is that we shouldn't wait for a single payer system in our country to have comprehensive tort reform as a part of reducing uh, not only uh, uh, the premiums that, that, that the healthcare community pays, but more importantly, the, the, the unnecessary medicine that's ordered as a result. My question to you, again, is whether or not within your respective companies you've looked at the amount of reimbursed care that you, you give through the insurers, uh, folks, what percent of that is done through defensive medicine uh, as a result of uh, a fear of these physicians being sued? I actually don't have the data with me, but I know the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association has done some work on this exact issue, so we'd be happy to submit that in follow-up. Could you provide us a copy of that? Yes, we will be happy okay. to do that. Anyone else? Uh, tort reform would be very helpful because tort the absence of tort reform increases the intensity of procedures that doctors perform, which is one key aspect of utilization, which you talked about before. If I may, I would just like to go back to your question about cost shifting with, um, with government programs. One of the things that happens with Medicare and Medicaid is that they, they lower reimbursement rates in an effort to get more efficiency out of the health care system. That in part does happen, but when uh, it, doesn't f it doesn't fully pay for the reimbursements, then what happens is there is a cost shift and the commercial segment, the commercial products, pay for that shortfall that's not made up by efficiency that comes from those reimbursement cuts. And that's estimated to be $1,500 for a family of four who has private health insurance. That's a, and if you look at the total cost of private health insurance, that is a major component of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Chairman, for uh, your generosity. Well, we're glad that you're on this committee and uh, we appreciate your participation. The chair uh, will recognize uh, the distinguished chairman of the Judiciary Committee who's joined us. Mr. Conyers, you may proceed. Thank you for this permission, Chairman Kucinich, and I, I want to thank you uh, for the hearing. Uh, these are distinguished, experienced members of the health insurance industry and uh, I'm sure the testimony has been very important as we work toward a reform of health care. And I also want to commend uh, the ranking Republican member, Aaron Schock, who is carving out quite a record of distinction for himself. And I'm, I'm glad he's here with us as well. Ms. Farrell, um, what what do you think the uh, what is your feeling about the the public option and how do you think it fits into health care reform as you see it, ma'am? My view of the public option is that I think we really need to focus our efforts on understanding what problems that we're trying to solve around access and quality and affordability, and then ask ourselves at the end of that whether or not a public plan would actually uh, progress us further down the path than some of the bills that have already been put in, in place. Um, you know, I do believe Could that- Could you pull I, the mic just a little closer, please? Yes. You know, one of the things that is concerning about a public plan, um, which the Congressman Schock was just uh, referencing, is the cost shift. I mean, if, if a public plan were to reimburse at Medicaid or Medicare rates, there would be quite a cost shift to the commercial segment 
which would in turn result in increased cost in, in the commercial sector and therefore increased premiums, which is really antithetical to what we're trying to achieve in, in health care reform. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Mr. Richards, uh, it's, it was my impression that the public option would be designed to save money, not cost more money, and that it would provide a, a choice between citizens as whether they wanted a private insurance plan, of which there are literally hundreds, or would they want a public plan? Is that your impression? Well, uh, Congressman, Cigna supports many of the reforms that are being debated in the debate um, in, in both the Senate and, and in the House, including personal coverage um, requirements, guaranteed coverage, the elimination of pre-existing conditions, um, and the reform of payment mechanisms. We believe if those reforms are enacted, then a government-run plan is not necessary. So, so uh, Mr. Sassi, you're, you're, I, I, if you agree with that last comment, then uh, you don't want any competition in the insurance, health insurance field, right? Well, I think, I think it is, it's our position that there is a lot of competition today in the health insurance industry. There are over 1,300 health insurers in this country that compete uh, for, for business. Yeah. Um, the, the challenge is that uh, when uh, the government could come in and have the ability to set reimbursement rates that it creates an unlevel playing field between private industry and the government. And that certainly has the potential to exasperate the cost shift that already occurs between Medicare and Medicaid and the private sector. We also fear that as a result of that, um, since we don't have, we would not have a level playing field since insurers are subject to taxes and other types of expenses, that lower reimbursements coupled with uh, taxes that we pay create a dramatically unlevel playing field, and that could reduce choice for the American public. Well, uh, Ms. Reeton, uh, with, with this unanimity against the public option, uh, we're, we're putting in a provision that everybody's got to get insurance, and if you can't afford it, guess who will pay for it? The government. And, 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 and you're talking about the public option will cost, uh, someone is talking about it, not you, but how could one public option destabilize 1,300 private insurance companies? Um, our company agrees with the statement that was made earlier that when you um, implement some of the reforms that are being discussed that um, require insurers to offer coverage to all individuals regardless of their health status, as long as they have a requirement to carry, uh, to ex access and carry coverage. Could you but pull your mic up just a little yeah, closer? Okay. But we do agree that there are people who are lower income, often working low income individuals, who will need some subsidy in order to be able to afford health care coverage. So we believe if you um, pass reform with all those elements, we actually will have a more well-functioning health care system today and have the ability to put in the market plans that can be affordable over time. Well, couldn't a public option accomplish that? We don't think that it's needed in order to accomplish that. Why not? There are a lot of people advocating it. Because those reforms that I've described have never been in existence in the United States. And so by passing them, we think that can significantly improve the health insurance system and make coverage both more accessible and more affordable. Well. You want? Surely. We have a public option in the VA. The Veterans Administration is essentially a public option, so we do have one here in this country. Well, what about Medicare? Who do you think runs that? Um, 
Well, let me... I'm not doing too well on these questions, Mr. Chairman. Uh, nobody seems to... I, I would suggest that the Chair is... Uh, Mr. Connie is doing very well with the questions. Uh, maybe the answer is that uh, we, we may be having difficulty <laughs> dealing with here, but your questions are just fine. <laughs> well, uh, l let me try... Uh, let me try Mr. Collins. Uh, have you ever heard of a universal single-payer health care system? Uh, yes, sir, I have heard of the concept. And, and have you uh, developed some feelings about it? Well, yes, sir, I, I, uh, um, I clearly I'm a partisan for the, uh, having a private health care, a robust private health care sector. I believe that the private health care sector brings a lot of value to the overall system that we have here. And of course, we have a robust public system with Medicare, Medicaid, the VA uh, system, TRICARE. Those are all components of the public system. I believe the private system is important because it brings innovation, it brings energy, it brings change, it brings ideas that are often used in the, in the public sector system as well. And I think we can uh, have both a, a private and public system. We can build on what's good in the public system, and, or in the uh, private system, and use those, those things to improve the private system as well, sir. Well, that's, that's encouraging. Uh, then why not, let's try the single payer system, HR 676. That's a mostly public system. What's wrong with it? Uh, I'm not actually, uh, familiar with that bill, if it, if, if it is a, uh, a, a single-payer system, it would be the end of the public system, uh, the private system as we know it, I believe. Is that, is that true, Mr. Uh, Bloom? Couldn't, does that, does that mean the private system goes out if you have a single-payer system? I think the primary concern, Congressman, is the fact uh, that we mentioned before with respect to the cost shift. The Medicare and the government programs, the VA, all of those programs have lower rates of reimbursement so that in the entire system, not all the costs are being covered by not the, not the proportional cost of, that, of care that those, programs, um, that those programs give are being borne by the government. So there is a shift, as I mentioned to Congressman Schock, of about $1,500 for a family of four every year. And so I think one valid concern mm -hmm. would be that if all of, yeah. there was a single payer and all of the uh, um, uh, costs were, were borne by the government, then there would be none of the innovations that the others have, have discussed. It would be the end of the commercial, but you would then have to, the government would then have to absorb all that other, all that other cost and that would make it, that would make it more expensive for everyone. There's also, I want to remind everybody what was said to, was said about the value of the, what the private sector provides. But what about all the cost increases that the health industry is imposing upon people with health care? Uh, not only in their premiums, but also in uh, the pharmacy uh, prescriptions that are being raised. I mean, you talk about cost shifting. Uh, the you ladies and gentlemen are, are representing companies that keep raising the cost of premiums every single year. And yet you're worried about somebody else shifting costs. The, the chair, uh, Mr. Conyers, uh, time has expired, but um, you know, each one of you that wishes to respond to his question, uh, please do so, and I would urge any or all of you to do it. Could would someone care to respond? Could, could, we, could we start? Ms. Farrell, could you help me understand how I can increase my sympathy for health insurance companies? Ms. Farrell? Yep. The way we look at premium increases every year and the way they're calculated is based on the underlying increase in medical costs. And so, so you have to do it. 
But the prophets are greater in help. The only people I can think of that make more profits than the industry that you six represent is oil and pharmacy. Uh, uh, the, the gentleman's time has expired. Oh, uh, oh I'm I, sorry. I, I, okay. <laughs> now, we're grateful that you're here. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, the chair recognizes Mr. Kennedy. And uh, we're grateful that you're here, Mr. Kennedy, and Thank we're you, grateful for your family's uh, lifelong commitment to health care for all Americans. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, to the panel, <clears throat> um, as my former colleague was just talking about the um, public option, and given the um, environment right now in Congress with respect to the political viability of a public option, I wanted to get to how we are going to implement savings in the event that a public option isn't passed. Uh, I am a strong favor of public option, want that on the record, but I understand that you know the political reality of what is going on right now in Congress shows that uh, that may or may not happen. If that doesn't happen, I want to hear today what insurance companies are going to do to step up to the plate to make sure that we don't waste a lot of time um, before we put into place what will be the alternative to a public option that is perhaps a trigger of the public option which means that we're going to have to wait for for us to show that insurance companies aren't doing their job before a public option then gets kicked into place and of course that's you know, an ugly kind of scenario because it basically is saying, okay, we're going to wait until uh, things go wrong before we fix them. Um, and, and that presupposes things are going to go wrong. So obviously we don't want things to go wrong. Um, and what I'd like to hear from you is, um, you know, we hear a lot of talk about different tools in healthcare that will save money and improve quality and efficiency. And we're all familiar with the inefficiencies in our current system that lead not only to wasted dollars and poor health outcomes for patients, but also huge administrative uh, headaches and red tape for patients. Uh, healthcare information technology, as I know, is one of the tools we talk about in achieving efficiencies. But another area, where we could generate savings and quality improvements is through a process called improve improvement tools such as value stream mapping and flat mapping. Uh, we talk about how to make uh, clinical improvements uh, to improve efficiency, so to save money, but what do you see for these uh, as potential to save uh, money uh, through the process of administrative improvements? And what can be done to incentivize the use of these tools uh, in not only making clinical improvements, but also making, you know, improvements in the whole process of administrative uh, making and cutting out a lot of that red tape that everybody always acknowledges is a big cumbersome part of your business. Could you tell us how do we incentivize in government a way for you to do the right thing. Congressman, I, th I think there are many things that uh, the private sector can work with government on. I think you brought up an important element, uh, health information technology. Um, I think, you know, there certainly uh, my company, WellPoint, is very interested in implementing health in uh, insurance technology. Examples include uh, e-prescribing and making sure that uh, making available to doctors the ability uh, via a PDA to uh, prescribe, to check for drug-to-drug -drug interactions, to get personal health information. We know all about, sorry to interrupt because we don't have much time, we know all about uh, IT and what it can do, but mm -hmm. how do we ensure that, you know, when you have an IT system, that it's actually an IT system that's working to the maximum of effect. Because we all know IT can work, but it doesn't do a lot of good to have IT and say all those great buzzwords about e-prescribing and, you know, doctor, you know, 
uh, supported protocols and all that stuff. It's not going to do well if you don't have a way of monitoring whether the system is actually running efficiently. Mm -hmm. And when the doctor says, oh, go out for these five referrals, and they go out to the front, and the administrative clerk only gives them three of the five. Who, now, who picks up that it was only three of the five? How do you measure whether your system is working up to speed? Who, who's going to be testing to make sure that you're doing the job in terms of getting the most efficiency out of your IT system? Well, I think each company owns that for their own IT areas, but I think it's a shared responsibility. See, that's the problem. See, that's the problem, because you can't have all these, you know, proprietary systems out there. Everybody thinks they've got this new age IT thing going, and then, you know, they've all got different systems for, oh, we're going to try to do this process more efficiently here, efficiently here and this process here, when we don't have standards. We have basic metrics for clinical care. But where are the metrics for making sure that you're going to do the best administratively? I mean, we can do all the protocols in the world when you come into an ER and say, you know, wash your hands, get this glove, get that glove, cooperate this way. We want this person to be treated so that they don't get an infection. What I want to know is what are you doing to standardize so no matter what IT system there is and what health system, we know that you all are doing, uh, you know, not your own proprietary thing, but is whatever proprietary thing is doing, it's... It's a good housekeeping seal of approval proprietary system that is squeezing out every bit of uh, waste and duplication and redundancy that it, there is out there. How do we know that it's really going to working to the best effect that it's supposed to be? Uh, gentleman's time's out. expired, but the witness, uh, you know, one of the witnesses may respond if, they, if you care to. Anyone? Uh, I, I think that Mr. Kennedy raised some important points in the follow-up uh, discussions that staff has with the uh, uh, panel. We we're, we'll explore that. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Uh, we're now going to go to round two of questions. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping here. Uh, in the last round of questions, I had asked uh, Mr. Richards for information about his uh, uh, town hall meetings. You know about all of our town hall meetings. We want to know about yours. And so you have internal town hall meetings, we watch your audio tapes, as well as copies of all minutes of those meetings and all memoranda that discuss th those meetings or actions decided at those meetings. So you'll be hearing from us in, a, uh, in an even more formal way, but just understand that we are going to, uh, we do want that information and I've just announced it from the uh, chair here. Uh, now, I, I the chairman to, yield? Uh, chairman, will you? Just uh, one quick question. If, we don't know whether the others have these types of materials. I was just was wondering, is the chairman planning uh, we'll, to we'll, uh, We will, at uh, Mr. Towns, uh, uh, at Mr. Cummings' request, uh, that we will uh, ask, um, so we're not singling you out, Mr. Richards, we'll ask everybody to produce the same information. Uh, you may not call them town hall meetings, but we'll try to find out what it is you have to try to organize your troops on the issue of uh, cost reduction. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Uh, questions and Mr. Now. Chairman, well, Mr. Kennedy. Uh, in, in response to the questions I asked, if they could, if all of them could get back to me on uh, actual tangible recommendations, as I pointed out, to what we can do to standardize incentives for them to have widespread standard adoption of IT to incentivize those savings. I thank can. Mr. Kennedy. Uh, this is, uh, you know, not solely an investigative subcommittee. We also look for recommendations as to how the existing system can be improved. So uh, as long as we have this system, I would imagine you, ladies and gentlemen, probably have uh, some pretty good ideas. So thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Uh, now, Ms. Farrell, uh, let's talk about Aetna. Aetna is the third largest private for profit insurer, according to Fortune magazine. Uh, but your current management returned your company to profitability by shedding members. You made bigger profits with fewer premium payers. Isn't that true? Are you referring to back in uh, the late 90s and early 2000s? That, when that, we you're, that you have made, there was a point at which you mm -hmm. shed. There was a point and your profits started to go up, isn't that right? 
There was a point in our history okay. where we were, as an enterprise, um, not profitable. And one of the reasons, the big reason why we were not profitable is we had underestimated medical costs. I'm sure. So well, we, that's exactly the point. So how many customers did you have to lose in order to return to profitability? How, I don't recall at the off top. It wasn't looked at in terms of how many members we had to lose. It was looked at in terms of how, what is the underlying rate of medical cost and how are we going to price appropriately, appropriately for that in the For, marketplace. Forbes magazine said you had to lose about eight million. We're going to put that article in the record. Uh, does Aetna have an estimate of how much medical expenses the company avoided by shedding those policyholders? Yeah, and I don't, I don't believe it was looked at that way. It was looked at relative to well, the underlying medical costs. Well, would you look at it that way? Can you, can you determine for us? You look at your internal uh, memoranda, at your, uh, uh, at your actuarials. Uh, you should be able to figure out how much money you actually saved by uh, shedding 8 million policyholders. I, I could look at that and, I, and I appreciate if you, you look at that. Also, um, almost all of those 8 million people receive their health insurance through employers. And they lost their Aetna health insurance when Aetna raised prices of the group plan beyond what the employers could pay. I mean, isn't that true? I would say that if they left us, it was beyond that, that which they thought was a reasonable premium increase. Thank you, yes. Mr. Farrell. Now, your CEO has spoken publicly about the significant investments in sophisticated information technology he authorized at the start of his leadership. I assume those IT investments helped Aetna identify employers for repricing. Uh, so I'm wondering, could you tell the subcommittee if uh, Aetna picks employers to shed by, for example, the type of occupation workers performed? No, that's not the way that we would do that. Age in the plan, the, the, the age of the workers. Yeah. Do you, so you're asking about our underwriting practices. Do, do yeah. you, do you, um, uh, does your IT system identify people by age and and do you pick employers to shed by the age of the workers in the plan? Our IT system does not identify people by age. The way it works is that an employer will provide us with a list of their employees, and along with that list would be other requirements in order to underwrite can, age. Can, it, can it identify how long someone has been in the system? It would identify how long they have been a member at Aetna, Okay. Yes. Now, uh, does, do you pick uh, employers to shed by claims histories of the workers in the plan, such as frequency of emergency room visits or disease clusters like cancer? Could you repeat your question? I'm sorry. You, you know, I'm just trying to explore mm -hmm. how employers get shed. Yep. Uh, do you look at claims histories of workers in a plan? For example, if somebody visits an emergency room frequently or there's a number of people with cancers, do you make decisions based on some of those principles? Are any of those programmed into your information technology? No, the, no we never drop a member because of an increase in their medical costs. Are they triggers? I mean, I, do you have any, like, some, some, there'll be a report that'll just be spit out that'll say, uh oh. Cluster of diseases here, cancer, high cost, out. No. That, that does not happen. It does not happen. And, and you don't screen by location or zip codes for there might be, a, or do you? Do you screen by location no, or zip codes? One, one of the ways we price our business is to actually look at geography because there are significant cost variations by geography across the United States. Are, are, today. Those, are those cost variations determined by, among other things, uh, epidemiological factors? They are determined by looking at the underlying costs by geography, and there can be significant variations just um, towns away from one another. So I, that's one of the things that we do take a look my, at. My time has expired on, on, mm -hmm. on this round, but what I'd like to do, Ms. Farrell, is uh, so that we can better understand uh, the relationship between your information technology and how it serves as a tool for decision making. If you could uh, provide this subcommittee with a narrative so that we can um, come to an understanding of the relationship between the, the, the data that you gather and 
the way that's used as a tool for your, um, for your decision making with respect to uh, your customers and whether they will continue to have policies. This should do, this would do shedding rescissions, um, even um, you know, any, any use of information technology that would be used to shed any of those 8 million customers. Yes. And, uh, and, and you know, uh, since we're trying to be fair to each and every one of you, uh, this subcommittee is going to ask uh, each and every one of you by, by letter to provide that information. That with the information technology that you have, how does it help, that, you know, does it help you decide uh, which customers to shed and how does it do that? Okay, uh, my time has expired. We're going to go to Mr. Schock. Uh, you have five minutes. You may proceed. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I guess in response to some of the concerns raised, uh, I would only say that, um, you know, I think most of us agree, or at least uh, I agree with the, co the, the comments that were made earlier, that health care premium costs are a function of reimbursement rates. And so, I think it's disingenuous to compare uh, a government-run plan to a private plan when a private plan cannot control for costs and a government plan can. In other words, uh, in a truly static system where uh, all reimbursement rates are set at a Medicare or Medicaid reimbursement level, um, the system then would be forced to control their costs uh, either by uh, reducing quality uh, or redu re reducing options. And I think for those of us who share the concern of a movement towards a, a single-payer system, it is, it is uh, clearly focused on uh, the quality of the care the patient will receive uh, and continuing the progress that this country and its health care system has made over those countries uh, with a, a different plan in terms of the innovation uh, and the technology that we have here in our country. Um, I can only speak from my experience uh, prior to being in Congress, which was uh, in the state legislature in Illinois, and I witnessed firsthand um, what happened in Illinois uh, under then uh, Rob Lagojevich's health care proposal, which was all kids, uh, which did similar to what uh, the majority wants to do here, which was basically offer health care a government plan for all kids in the state of Illinois, regardless of income. I saw firsthand in my, my legislative office individuals who had children insured, uh, individuals who were duly employed by a, uh, a, a, an employer who offered a private health care plan and who opted for the savings of anywhere from $50 to $70 a month to take their child out of the private plan and enroll them in the all kids uh, Medicaid reimbursement level health care plan. Now it did two things. Number one, uh, I had a very poor legislative district, 40,000 voters, 20,000 of them on food stamps. The, 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 the uh, people living in poverty who otherwise had access to care, their access dried up uh, and went away. Uh, today, there is not a dentist in the city of Peoria, Illinois that will take an all kids patient. Second, uh, it ballooned the deficit uh, within the state of Illinois uh, Medicaid program, all kids program. We are now nine months late in our reimbursement levels. So I would just throw this out there as a case in point example, a microcosm in our country uh, where we have tried a similar option, uh, a competition, if you will, against private insurers. Second, uh, and, and to that point, I just don't, I don't buy the concept that the solution to greater quality, greater access, and lower costs is the government. To that point, though, I think we need to do a better job uh, of providing, if we, if we understand we're trying to control costs, if everyone, under, if everyone accepts the fact that health care premiums rising are making it more difficult for businesses to provide health insurance, for individuals to provide health insurance, how do we lower the, the, the health care premium costs? Well, then we have to lower the, the request for services uh, and, or, or the rates that we're, we're paying back. My question to you would be, um, how do we give those tools to the consumer? Because it's my view right now as consumers, uh, if I have a, a private play health care plan, whether it's provided to me as an individual or whether it's provided to me by my, empl my employer, I don't have the tools necessary 
uh, there's been a lot of competition. I'm digressing a little bit. But there's, a lot of co there's, there's been a lot of talk about health insurance being compared to automobile insurance. The biggest difference I see in automobile insurance is that if my car gets in a wreck, uh, I'm going to do one of two things. I'm going to go around and I'm going to get probably two or three estimates, not because I'm going to pay for it out of pocket, but because I know when I turn in my automobile uh, expenses, my automobile insurance rates are going to go up. That connection doesn't seem to be there while it's true, but that con connection doesn't seem to be in the mind of the patient as he or she accesses the healthcare system. So what tools can you in the insurance industry give to consumers? How can we look at maybe reforming the way in which people buy their health care, not, not, not the premium, but rather the actual service, how they buy it? And I understand you can't do it with emergency care. But if I go in, there's, you know, I, I live in a relatively large city, 150,000 people. A lot of places offer MRIs. And, and each one of those locations charges a different rate. Yet that information is not readily available to me as a consumer. And I think that is a part and parcel to us doing a better job of controlling the costs that go and drive up health care premiums. So if you could answer that question, I'd appreciate it. What are you doing now, and what could we be doing uh, to give those tools better to consumers? General, it's time's expired, but, but the witnesses can answer the question. Go ahead. Thank you. Congressman, I, I can answer that for my company, WellPoint. Uh, several years ago, we embarked on a journey to uh, increase the transparency uh, so that consumers could uh, more easily compare the prices of commonly used uh, services uh, within their geographic area, because you're right. There is a large disparity between uh, an MRI in one part of the city and another part of the city, a cost uh, for uh, uh, commonly uh, knee replacements in one part of the city versus others. So we created uh, what we call Anthem Care Compare, which is a website that identifies the top 34 elective type procedures. Um, and a member can go into that website, type in their zip code, and it will call uh, identify different providers within the area and the costs associated uh, that would be charged by the different facilities for those uh, areas. Plus, we try and tie in as much quality, publicly available quality information that is available uh, to members so that if you're considering uh, having your knee replaced uh, at a certain facility, how often do they do that procedure? And what is the success rate? What are the readmission rate for that? Uh, we've rolled that out uh, in many of our markets across the country. And actually, uh, we're now uh, uh, providing that service to many Blue Cross Blue Shield plants across the country. So that's, that's one example of how we can increase the transparency. Uh, Congressman, you mentioned MRIs, which is a great example. In some geographies, the cost of an MRI can vary by 100 percent or more, depending on where you go. Um, at Cigna, we've provided the cost of MRIs um, on our website so individuals can go and look it up. Um, the vast majority of uh, um, the healthcare providers that work with us allow us to do that. There are some that um, do not allow us to show the transparency, but the vast majority do. Um, and it, it does help. The other thing I would say is, um, along the lines of tools, um, that you need to provide the incentives to individuals. Um, and I think uh, one of the Cygnus customers is Safeway, and I think they're a marvelous example of a company that has worked um, with Cigna to both in increase the cost and quality transparency, because it's not just cost that varies, but quality varies as well, um, among their employees so that they can get the right care, um, get it at the, at the most efficient price. Um, they also incent people for um, appropriate behaviors, whether that's not using tobacco or exercising. Because um, at the end of the day, um, for Safeway, if you have a healthier employee, it's also going to be a lower cost employee. I thank uh, Mr. Schock for uh, his uh, presence here. And, and if you have a follow up question, you want to put them in writing, we'll make sure that. Uh, they're, uh, they go through the committee, and we support your request. Thank you. Uh, you know, you, you brought up the, that issue. I just want to, as chair, just take the liberty of pointing out that, you know, when you brought up the issue about car insurance and, and compared to health insurance, I mean, that's like, that's one of the debates right now. And just what, it, what occurs to me is that if, uh, if you wreck your car, you can get a new car. If you wreck your health, you're dead. You know, unless you 
believe in reincarnation. Mr. Shack, thank you. Thank you. Chair recognizes Mr. Cummings. You know, as I was uh, sitting here listening to you all, I was saying to myself, um, boy, they sound real nice. I mean, it sounds like everything's rosy. And, um, you know, when we, it's amazing, the people who sat here yesterday um, made us, I mean, said some things that were very, um, I thought, I thought very, um, damaging to the to what you all do every day. I'm not talking about you all individually, of course. And the thing I, I guess that I'm just sort of wondering about, and I, they made a big deal of this whole denial of claims. And I specifically asked them the question about whether they felt that things were worse or better since the Clintons tried to get through health care reform, and they said that they were far worse uh, with regard to denial of claims. And so, Ms. Farrell, I'm, I'm going to go to you because I, 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 for one reason, because you had said something that interests me. You had talked a little bit early about uh, claims that there were no, there was no one that did only, I think, or maybe it was several of you said only doctors deny claims. Is that right? So you all are telling me that there are no other non-medical people who make decisions that a, a person cannot get a certain treatment paid for? Is that what you're telling me? Just to clarify, what I said was that there are no medical decisions or no medical denials that are made by somebody who is not a physician. You can deny a claim for a non-medical reason, and that decision can be made, obviously, by a non-clinician. And, uh, and I take it that those kind of decisions are made every day, are they not, by non-medical people? Non-medical non decisions, yes. yes, can be made by non-medical people. But if it's medical-related, it is made by a physician. And so a claim, and a claim is for services, I just want to make sure our definitions are right again, mm -hmm. services that are already rendered, is that right? A claim is normally for something that's art. I see you shaking your head, Mr. Bloom. Is that right? I think that we, we're, as a group here, struggling with what the definition of a denial of a claim is. Okay. To me, a claim, to, when I cited what the survey said on, about us, a claim, there, there are basically three kinds of claims. And the first kind has been really enunciated here quite well. That's when you get a duplicate claim. Okay, That's when you've, done, you've rendered service, as you said, and then you get a claim that comes in, and then another claim comes in, and you've probably paid the first one. In the denial rate, in the numbers I cited, the 5.7 that we have, and the 5.4 that we have, and the 8.7 that Medicare Part B has, in those claims, those, those, the biggest cause of that is duplicate claims. The next kind of claim is for experimental or investigational, where there wasn't any pre-authorization, which was also discussed earlier. Mm -hmm. Then the last kind is where the employer has not decide has has through the policy terms decided we are not going to cover that kind of a claim that kind of a process that kind of a procedure mm -hmm. now the other thing that we're struggling when when you are asking questions i believe you're also talking about coverage determination yes. whether people have coverage in advance of when services are mm -hmm. covered okay i i got to ask you this well i understand that a person can have their treatment pre-authorized and even get a pre-authorization number, get treatment, and still the payment for that same procedure may be denied. Is that true? In a coverage determination, there, there's an initial decision made about whether this procedure is covered. And that, in our company, like in the case of Ms. Farrell's company, that's done on a, on a denial of coverage is only, for medical reasons, is only done by a licensed board certified medical director. And so, and so none of you all then, nobody up here has anyone who denies a person uh, treatment. In other words, that's, in, in other words, how many of you all deny folks, any of you, if any of you all, have people who you give bonuses to 
or give financial incentive for denial of treatment? Nobody. Right. I answered before neither. None. No. Okay. I just think that I think that the based upon the testimony that we got yesterday, uh, the testimony was clear that there are many, many instances that where insurance companies are basically intentionally um, and maybe coverage may be called coverage may be called whatever, holding that decision and literally waiting for certain things to happen and instead of having to commit to the death. And, and uh, you know, the person is denied one way or the other. So, so he dies, and the chairman said, here, different with automobile, the person dies. And that's a sad, sad situation. Chair, recognize Mr. Conyers. You, you may proceed for five minutes, Mr. Conyers. Thanks for your generosity, uh, Chairman Kucinich. Uh, Ms. Farrell, uh, are you aware of the uh, report from Health Care for America now? that you're referencing, but uh, at its profits, for every dollar we take in, we pay about, we make about five cents in profit, pay about 84 cents in medical costs. Well, what about uh, you, uh, are you aware of this report? I'm not aware of that report. I do okay. know that um, uh, if you look at Cigna's total profits globally, we make about a dollar. Ms. Reeton, you, you must have heard about this. I have not heard of it. In There's been an enormous amount of growth among the top companies, and it's, so it's simply adding up the gross profits of companies yeah. as they've grown over time. So there is a larger share of profitability today yeah. in those top companies yeah, the, than there was the 10, 10 years ago. But that does not mean that profits have grown per member, per unit of business, per, per uh, customer. That it, it does sure. one necessarily doesn't flow from the other. It's a function Mr. of Bloom, the size you, of the you know about this, don't you? I'm not permitted to let me comment on my company. Well, I, I don't want you to comment on your company. You're not familiar with the statement. I'm not familiar with the statement. I'm not familiar with the statement. In the business. I've been in my beginning of 2001. And, and statistics, but it's not an unfamiliar statistic that uh, in terms of some markets don't have a lot of competition, but well, most markets have much competition. Excuse me. Well, do you contest this uh, a finding of the AMA? I don't know enough to contest or affirm. Okay. Well, let's, let's go down the line again then. Ms. Farrell, you, you're a student of the I know you subscribe to AMA journals. You've heard of it. I am not aware of that specific You never study. heard of it. Uh, Richards, you never heard of it. No, I 
No, Congressman. Well, let me just ask it the same time. Has anybody ever heard of it? Has anybody ever heard of the AMA? Yes. <laughs> yes. All right. Um, oh. Well, let me let me ask you about this. Uh, have you ever heard of the statement that's been made public, and to my knowledge, never contested, that the ten largest companies in health insurance, the CEO's compensations totaled a hundred and eighteen point six million dollars, an average of eleven point nine million dollars per CEO. Now let's save some time. Anybody ever heard of that before? Nobody. Well, you want a citation for it? Not particularly. Okay. All right. Uh, let me ask you this, Ms. Farrell. What is your annual compensation per year? My annual compensation is something that um, is very private to me and well, it's well, something that I would be minute. happy to submit. You to don't want to tell me. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying that it's, it's, I consider my compensation to be very private yeah. and that I would be happy to submit it to the committee in writing. But you don't want to say it publicly? No, because I do consider it to be private. Uh -huh. uh, Mr. Conyers, uh, be before you came, we asked the uh, witnesses to submit information about their compensation oh, uh, okay. in, in writing. Uh, if they uh, choose not to um, uh, answer at this committee meeting, but they will present it to us oh. in, in writing, oh, okay. we can, we can well, still get that that's information. That's a fair agreement. L last question. Uh, does anybody here, I I've never had a hearing where six executives of health insurance were all in the same panel. This is a new experience for me. Do any of you want to tell me what your annual compensation is, just for the record, without having to submit it in writing? If the witnesses uh, care to respond, you can do that. If, if you don't, uh, we certainly want you to submit that in writing. What, what do you want to tell me, Ms. Reed? I'll tell you, um, I make $728,000 a year in salary. Okay, I, I thank you for that. And what did you want to tell me, Ms. Uh, Mr. Bloom? Uh, my, my compensation is $545,000 a year. It's a matter of public record. Sure. I, and I thank you for that. And what do you want to tell me, Mr. Sasse? I'd be it's happy okay. to provide it in writing, but um, it's a privacy issue. It's uh, what? I, I consider it a, a privacy issue, mm -hmm. and I'd be happy to submit it in writing. Oh. Okay. Well... John. Yes, I'll you. Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> if I, before the gentleman, before we go to Mr. Kennedy, um, I, I just wanted, I just wanted understood that um, you've agreed to submit this information to the committee. Uh, as long as, as we have that agreement, that's fine. You can choose to answer the question now, or you can choose to answer it in writing. It's really your choice. Uh, and so, so, Mr. Kennedy, is Mr. Kennedy. Yeah. No, I, I just, uh, to, to yield, just to be happy, John was uh, bringing up a point. I think the folks here are just obviously just working as in, the, in a field that's perfectly legal and, in a, and yeah. set up by our society to, right. to earn what they're doing, and I, nothing wrong with that. I think what is wrong, as the gentleman's trying to point out, is that last year the head of Cigna earned $11 million. Now, if you're going to talk about where that money's coming from, it's clearly coming from denied claims. The uh, head of the United Health Group earned $9.4 million. Now, these are public records, so you don't have to ask anybody here. They're, they're uh, nice to, I'm sure they love to be called uh, senior executives, but frankly, John, I, I think they hope to be senior executives at that, those kinds of pay scales, but they're, I'm sure not at that level yet but the point is we're trying to make the point that the industry is allowing for these kinds of exorbitant uh, pay at the very top which just beg the question we it's an allowable industry in our country but we need to know you know kind of what 
is this uh, a matter of where these dollars are coming from when people are paying these premiums and people are getting rejected for health care? Um, how are these compensations so exorbitant? So I appreciate the questions you're asking. I, I also understand the, the fact that these individuals here have every right to uh, say and do what they're um, you know, doing because Mr. Kennedy, they're just working we're gonna, in an industry. If that's I may, Mr. Kennedy, Mr. Conyers' time has expired. Yeah. However, uh, we will now go to you, you, Mr. Kennedy, if you want to yield any time back to Mr. Okay. Conyers. You, yeah. can, uh, you can proceed for five minutes and we're going to go one more round after that and then we'll be done. Okay. Because I know everyone here is trying to well, um, your plans I'd like to, uh, Mr. Chairman, go go uh, go back to this uh, <coughs> whole idea of of how we're if if insurance has thus far um, not gotten around to figuring out ways to help the government or the society change reimbursement reform. If we known for years that our system is upside down, that all we do is pay for sick care rather than health care, if there are simple ways for us to keep people from being frequent flyers in our emergency rooms, if we just did X, Y, and Z, and that that would lessen the pressure on you as insurers to charge your customers exorbitant premiums then why haven't you in your industry taken upon yourself to be the biggest advocates for insurance reform over the last 20 years? And furthermore, what I don't get is that uh, back home, like most of my businesses, like are, for the most part, are passive when it comes to their insurance premiums. They let their insurer insurance carriers kind of dictate to them, they said, oh, well, here's your premium this year. And in fact, it's the insurance companies that work for their, uh, the company that they uh, are, you know, subscribing for. And um, they've been hired to do their uh, policies for. And so I just don't, for the life of me, understand why, if it's in the interest of their client to reduce premium costs and, and so forth and health, why insurers in this country haven't been at the forefront of this health care debate saying, listen, we've got to, here are the ways we can restructure the health care market based upon a capitalist system whereby it pays to have better care at reduced costs. That's what I can't figure out, Mr. Chairman. If this is really about making money, we know there's plenty to be made. Why can't they build a better mousetrap to make money and also save save money and give us the answers. You think it's co consistent. I have to sit up here and ask about things that I frankly am not all that educated about because my staff person puts it in front of me and they're going to promise to get back to me on, you know, value-based streamlining in engineering. Uh, that, can that apply to health care? Um, you know, all of these kinds of things that we're going to have to try to would have put in law so as to enforce insurance companies to bring their costs down? I mean, what is, why do we have to put that into law? I'm sure they don't want to be regulated any more than they are being regulated. So tell us why, because we're being pressured to bring our deficit down. We've got this enormous deficit. It's going to swallow up all our future dollars, taxpayer dollars. Our taxpayers are going crazy because they're getting on our tail for uh, having a big deficit. And what we're trying to do is respond to them and say health care is one of the biggest financial nuts our country has going forward. So we're asking you, help us, because one way or the other, money's going to get, um, have to be streamlined, and it's a question of whether it's going to be done at the expense of our consumers, which we don't want, or it's going to be done efficiently and with quality in mind so that people don't get their health care cut just because we haven't been the on the forefront of making the right decisions policy-wise that allows them to continue their health care in the most efficient way possible. Maybe you could comment on why you don't think you guys have been in the head of the game in terms of getting better reimbursement reform uh, prior to this year. Why does the government have to do all this incentivizing for um, health rather than sick care? Why, why are we the ones who have to do this? Why, can't, why haven't you been out there for years doing this stuff? Congressman, I'd love to respond to your question. Um, first of all, I think there are some things that we can do individually. Certainly at Cigna, we do several things to 
improve the health of our um, customers. For instance, um, we have a gaps in care program where we um, monitor for evidence-based care to identify if our customers aren't getting the care they need. For instance, somebody who has recently had a heart attack um, who's not on the proper medication, a beta blocker. By mining that data, we can then outreach to that individual's doctor and to the individual and say, shouldn't this person be on a beta blocker? Because medical evidence would say that for most people that's appropriate, and if they don't take that drug, they're much more likely to have another heart attack. So that's an instance where we are using technology in our people to actually increase pharmaceutical claims um, for the better health of the, of the individual. That's something we can do and do do alone today. Relative to your payment reform question, um, again, Cigna is um, working with um, a variety of, of um, healthcare professionals. I referenced um, Dartmouth-Hitchcock in New Hampshire. We're actually working with five other um, entities around the country for payment reform where we have a, a patient-centered medical home where a primary care doctor can coordinate the care because it's, it is a complex system. If somebody's very sick, they tend to need a lot of different doctors and having that primary care person look after the care um, is very important. A lot of primary care doctors can't afford to do that today um, because the, the reimbursement rates that Medicare and private insurers pay them, it's very tough for them to be able to do that. So the medical home is a promising um, pilot that we're trying where we are paying extra money to those primary care physicians to allow them the time to help coordinate the care. So I think there are things that we can do individually. There are things we can do in partnership with um, healthcare professionals, the doctors and hospitals. And then I think there are things that the government needs to help on as well. And Cigna and the industry have definitely supported um, reforms for a variety of things um, that we've mentioned at the, uh, at the committee today, where we really need government to work with us to, to help enact some reform as well. And we look forward to working with you in, the, in this debate, uh, Congressman Kennedy. My point is that medical home we've known for a long time works. Why are we piloting it? I know it's what we're piloting in the legislation, but we're only doing it because we're slow walking something that we know works. It's been demonstrated over and over again. I mean, it makes so much common sense. It's like this whole trigger thing. We're doing what is inevitable, but we're doing going to take us extra four or five years before we take the whole medical home thing to scale because we're just, you know, there's too many financial interests that we're going to have to tiptoe around in order to get this thing implemented. But if you guys stood up and said, hey, we all know medical homes are about making more efficient, giving the primary care doc and gatekeeper more time to help coordinate care, because 80% of the dollars spent on 20% of the people, they're the chronic users, they're the highest pay uh, users of health care. That's where we get the most money. Let's do it. Boom. Let's go. What are we slowing down for? The reason we're slowing down is because there's this inertia out there because everybody's trying to protect their piece of the turf. And we wouldn't have that if insurance was more proactive. It's in, in your interest to be more proactive because at the end of the day, we're going to hit the wall. And when we hit the wall, you know, everyone else who's well off is going to be fine. It's the people in the middle and the bottom are going to be the ones that get hurt. You know, the, gen the gentleman's uh, uh, time expired quite a while ago, but I, I'll tell you, I think everyone uh, in this room and everyone watching uh, knows how important what you just said is, and we're wondering if there's any response to Mr. Does, he, does the industry care to respond to what Mr. Kennedy said? And in a way, what he's providing is a wake-up call here. Do you, does anyone here care to respond? We're going we're gonna to have one more, uh, Mr. Kennedy. We're, we're going to have one more round after this, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, anyone want to respond to Mr. Kennedy? Uh, Mr. C uh, Chairman Kucinich, we've uh, submitted. Uh, and we'll submit for the record uh, proposals that we circulated with the administration in Capitol Hill of $500 billion of potential savings. Uh, I won't... Uh, over what period of time? Over, over a uh, period of time from uh, 2010 to 2019. And uh, we'll submit this uh, report to the committee uh, as part of the record. How much was that again? It was uh, $540 billion, sir. Okay, uh, th that would be helpful. And anyone who wants to submit similar information, uh, so ordered, and we appreciate you doing that. I, I, I just want to say that um, uh, as we go to the final round of questions here, um, I'm sure that the insurance company executives who are here recognize that everything's changed with respect to health care in America. 
you're facing a totally new environment than when you started your careers in healthcare. Uh, 47 million people uninsured, another 50 million underinsured. As you know, many people are, are losing everything they have because they can't afford to pay their hospital bills. And many of those people had insurance. And so today we're, we're talking about this business model. But, but we also have to understand, I mean, we have great respect for you being here, but we also have a great understanding of your position and your political power. Let me give you an example. The insurance companies are so powerful that you were, you were able to take H.R. 676, Medicare for All, right off the table, right at the beginning of the discussion, for either party, just about one party or another, both parties, took it off the table. There's 85 members of Congress who have signed on to it. It's a bill that Mr. Conyers and I drafted. 86, thank you. But, but the, point, the point is that you were able to exert your influence, and you gave some of the reasons here today. I mean, it very clearly, it clashes with your business model. Um, we, we understand that, that you're very influential here. Based on your influence, we're seeing the so-called public option, which would provide some competition. We understand you feel that it wouldn't be productive. But based on your influence, the public option looks like it's, it's going to be very difficult to get into a final bill. Um, and of course, the industry has had an influence in shaping issues such as triggers and, um, and co-ops. Uh, what Mr. Kennedy had to say that I think is so important and where, where Mr. Kennedy's comments lead to is that you should be thinking about the fact that the business model that you have could end up being, um, could end up killing the goose that laid your golden egg. You may be reaching an end point as to as to how much uh, medical loss ratio you can go before people start to say, what's going on here? How far can your executives go making millions of dollars a year? Well, people's p claims are being denied. You, say, you might say there's no connection, but the public does make a connection. Um, And look at where we're headed towards. This is where your presence here is not a small matter. We, we, we could very well be headed towards a condition where health care reform in America is really more of a, a continuation of what I call insurance care, whereby the 30 million people, according to CBO, would be potentially covered by H.R. 3200. Without a public option, 30, 30 million people would be pushed into private plans. They have to choose among private plans, and if they don't do that, and they don't choose, and they don't pay, they, they can be penalized. Um, it's extraordinary. But with that kind of power, I, I would hope uh, you start to think about a different model of, uh, of business's social responsibility. I'm not lecturing you here, I'm just sharing, sharing some thoughts. Um, the insurance industry because of changes in the global climate is due to take an enor enormous hits, particularly in coastal areas over the next 40 years. There are areas we should be working together. But on health care, you, you may eventually want to think about what it's going to be like when you wind down your health care products. Because I, I, frankly, Mr. Chairman, I think sooner or later, whether it's, it's this decade or another decade, we're, you're moving towards a condition where more people are going to be uninsured, more people will be underinsured, premiums, co-pays, and deductibles are going to be out of the reach of more and more Americans, and they're going to put it on you. And you know that. And, and so, you know, I didn't call you in front of this committee today to embarrass you. That's not my intention at all. We need to get information about how your business model works. Because people really need to understand that. We, we understand you're not charitable organizations. That's not why you were formed. You're responsible to shareholders. We understand that. 
If, you, if your medical loss ratio changes too significantly, Wall Street will punish you. We understand that, too. The question is, is this business model sufficient to provide health care for the American people? At a cost that's affordable. There's a collision here. And you're, you happen to be at that time and place where this collision is happening. I'm going to ask uh, one final question as I uh, wrap up my uh, time here. Yesterday, we received testimony from Aaron Ackley of Montana. Aaron's father, William Ackley, and his, his obituary is part of the record, uh, had a request for a bone marrow transplant. And that request was denied coverage on four separate occasions, causing a delay of 126 days in his cancer treatment. He ended up dying from the cancer. Now, Aaron Ackley told this committee that he had been enrolled in Medicare, that, that had he been enrolled in Medicare, he would have received his bone marrow transplant right away. And government-run Medicare provides primary health insurance to most senior citizens, has developed standardized forms, standardized benefits. Its administrative costs, as you know, are a fraction of yours as a percentage of revenues. Now, I'm, I'd just like to go down the line and answer this question. Um, isn't it true that your reason for not adopting Medicare's coverage standards as your own is that you could not deny payment for expensive treatments, such as the one I just referred to? Mr. Collins. Uh, Chairman Kucinich, I, I can't answer that question. I'm not familiar with the Medicare guidelines. That would have been okay. something appropriate for our Chief Medical Mr. Officer Sasser. to discuss. Yeah, uh, um, like Mr. Collins, I am not familiar with okay. that. Okay, Ms. Farrell. The same, unfortunately, I'm not familiar either. Mr. Blum. Or myself. Mr. Richards, can you answer that? Um, no, our Chief Medical Officer actually used to be the Chief Medical Officer for CMS, Dr. Jeffrey Kahn. Thank you. Had he been here today, I'm sure he could have answered it. Thank you, but I'm glad that you're here. Because, because I got a chance to, to ask you about your town hall meetings. And I'm really interested in that. So thanks for being here, Mr. Richards. Ms. Reed. I've got the same problem that everyone else mentioned. Our, one of our chief medical officers um, could have answered that question. See, see the, I mean, you know, where you may not be as familiar with the uh, Medicare standards. And I'll accept that answer. Uh, but I think you understand why I asked the question. And that is, uh, we're trying to get to the genesis of the business model here. How do you make money? Now, many Americans believe that insurance companies make money not providing health care, that your first obligation is to the stockholders, the shareholders, and then you have an obligation somewhere down the road to the people who are your policyholders. You have to have some obligation. You do pay. You said you have. You have a pretty good batting average in a lot of that. But when you get into the mechanics of analyzing it, to raise some questions, which is what we did here today. Mr. Conyers, uh, do you have uh, five more minutes for uh, questions, or do you well, wish I'm to? I'm so nearly exhausted, Mr. Chairman. I, I hardly have anything else to say uh, but to thank you for this meeting and to thank our witnesses for holding up. But. Uh, you know, uh, it's been made public that the American Medical Association has sort of come out for the Obama approach. You, you, all, you all have heard about that, have you? No. N yes, no. Okay. Uh, uh, you, you don't know if the a AMA is with Obama or not. What about your companies? Uh, have have your companies said anything one way or the other about Obama's strategy of health reform? Anybody? You don't know? Well, yes, uh, sir. Congressman uh, Cigna has come out, as have many others in the industry, and supported many aspects of right. the president's plan. Oh, okay. Well, then let me put it more delicately. There, there are are there parts of the Obama HR 3200 approach that you are that your company is for, and there are other parts you you may not be in full accord with? Is that about fair enough? Is that everybody shakes their head. There's, there's there are parts you can go along with, and some parts 
obviously the public option is not one of your favorite parts of the bill, wherever it may appear. But there, there may be some other things. But there are things you like. Congressman, I'd say there, there are many things we like, yes. Pardon? There are many things we like, yes. Many things you like, yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, let, me, let me just ask you about uh, the Bacchus bill. Now, you, you got a reaction. D did he make a, a little impression on you or somewhat favorable? Uh, how, how, does, how does that resonate with your, your uh, company? Congressman, just uh, from Cygnus' standpoint, I know that uh, Senator Bacchus just came out with it, and we are still reviewing the details of, of that bill. Yeah, but so am I. I mean, we all got the news at the same time. It's been on television, newspapers, commentators, doctors. Come on. I mean, how long do you have uh, to, Congressman, I mean, how from, much study do from you? From my understanding, there's no legislative language, actually, that's been shared yet. Um, but again, we are studying at least what has been released. Really? That, that's my understanding, yes. But he's been preaching about his bill and copying headlines all over the place. And you say there's been nothing specific. There's a bill out. It's got the chairman of the Finance Committee of the Senate. Well, I'll tell you what. Could you, I know you've got a lot of assignments coming here today. Could you let me know uh, uh, when you, when your companies have, have examined it su sufficiently to, to let me know what you think of it? Okay, all right, all right, all right. thank you very much. Now, finally, um, uh, we had testimony in the Judiciary Committee under Subcommittee Chairwoman Linda Sanchez uh, from doctors that there were one million medical bankruptcies in the United States. Uh, that is personal bankruptcies caused by medical bills. Ever hear of that? Nobody's heard of that. Okay. Um, well, I can't. I can't ask you to comment on that. L let's let's do it hypothetically. If you heard and learned about that, would that cast some concern on you about the uh, the problems that individuals are going through when when the largest cause of individual bankruptcies in the United States are due to medical bills that people couldn't afford, you'd be concerned. Well, may I send you some things? You're sending us a lot of things. Can I send you some more information about that subject? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your generosity. I, well, I thank the gentleman. Uh, finally, uh, Congressman Kennedy, you may proceed for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this hearing, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. Thank you all for your patience uh, this afternoon, hearing our questions and looking forward to getting responses to the ones that I asked earlier. Um, <clears throat> I would ask all of you if you would just give me a affirmative in terms of working with my office in closing a loophole that appeared in last year's Wellstone Domenici Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act bill. Um, we applied it to all insurers for mental health benefits. It seems as though college students' health insurance plans are, do not have the, um, it's not applicable to college students' health care plans because students are not technically employees of the university. So the bill talks about this as covering employee-based health insurance plans. So you see the wrinkle there. And as a result, since students aren't considered employees, they're not subject to the requirement 
the, the insurance companies aren't, who, who insure students aren't subject to the requirement for parity. And because suicide amongst kids is the third larding, largest cause of death, I would ask all of you now, would you be willing to work with me to close that loophole in this health bill with language that ensures that the spirit of the law that's applying to all of you for every other health insurance plan is ensures that kids who need it the most, if you will, get that coverage as, as uh, mandated under the Wellstone Domenici parity bill. Yes, yeah, Cigna actually strongly supported the Domenici Kennedy bill and we'd be happy to work with you to close the loophole. That would be great. Okay, um, if you could, William Gardner in my office, and if you could be in touch with him, we're just trying to make sure we get that uh, facilitated in this bill so that the kids don't uh, get, <coughs> you know, disrupted in their health insurance coverage. Um, obviously, I have a lot of other things, but just want to make sure we tidied that up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Kennedy and Mr. Conyers, uh, for remaining. Um, this, uh, uh, this has been a hearing of the Domestic Policy Subcommittee of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. Uh, we have uh, gone over three hours now, and the, uh, the witnesses uh, have uh, been much appreciated in your presence here. The title of today's hearing between you and your doctor, the private health insurance bureaucracy. Uh, I, I feel, as Mr. Kennedy just implied, that uh, we've barely scratched the surface here. But I, I hope that the witnesses uh, understand and hope that you feel that this committee has treated you fairly. Uh, there's no browbeating here. There's no trick questions. There's no attempt to try to force you to give an answer over something that you're not ready to do at this moment. And that's the way we're going to continue to proceed. We are, we are a fact-finding, investigative subcommittee. We're going to continue to try to get information from the industry so that we can understand your business model a little bit better. And, and while I uh, try to conduct these hearings in an impartial way, uh, away from these hearings, I'm a very strong advocate of the bill that I wrote with John Conyers. Uh, but I, I, I don't let that interfere with the conduct of this meeting. I want to make sure that you're given a chance to put your point of view on the record. And so while, while you're treated fairly here, we're hopeful that you're going to treat, um, treat the American people fairly. And I think as we, as we move uh, forward, this uh, issue of awareness, Mr. Conyers is going to send you some information. I think it's... it's this is a time that we can become more aware of your business model and maybe you can become more aware of why we have such great concerns and why there's a national movement right now to uh, really move away from the model that you've spent your life building. So um, it's a great time for this debate in the country. Uh, healthcare ends up being a flashpoint. You know this. People losing their jobs, their homes, their retirement security, their investments. And, and you're right at the point where it's a... It's a flashpoint. So let's see if there is a way that we can uh, find to best serve the American people. That's why we're in Congress, and I hope that's uh, what you'll conclude is a good purpose to uh, be in business. I'm Congressman Dennis Kucinich, Chairman of the Subcommittee. This committee stands adjourned.